No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and we got Danny Mullen on the podcast today. How you doing, man? I'm doing not really great. I'm pretty hungover, actually. Devastatingly so. Really? Yeah. That bad? One of your interns slipped me this thing that looks like Mad Dog 2020. Yeah. I don't know if it's FDA regulated. I'm going to try it right now. I've seen those being dropped off here, and apparently there's a lot of alcohol in them, but I haven't, I haven't dove in yet. This might be the official end of my career. I might go off the rails here on No Jumper. And thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be here. And one of your biggest fans listens to every show, is on the couch with my girlfriend. I know. And uh, I love that. the only person she's a bigger fan of is uh, Little House Phone. Little and, House Phone, who claims that he's on his way here. So yeah. we got to have the camera ready just in case he strolls in. I'm curious if we can... I mean, we, at the very least, we should get him to make out. Oh, I'd love that, yeah. That would be great. And then if they want to take things a step further, maybe we can get audio of whatever they're doing in the bathroom. Mm. <laughs> is, that, is that something we could shoot for? I, I mean, I like that idea. I almost like wonder if the bathroom's problematic, given that we have a bunch of people working. Maybe we could get like a hotel or like an alley around the corner. There's a lot of good alleys. <laughs> There's a lot of good alleys. There are great alleys, man. Around here? No, honestly. Like, I've, I've looked through a lot of alleys looking for like bike skates spots i noticed that you can kickflip and you show it off in every video but like that makes me dig. sort of want to patrol dig. the the alleys everywhere around here and yeah i haven't really found anything to ride but there's definitely some sex spots i think we need to set up an airbnb service for sex alleys <laughs> i uh there was i used to stay i was a bouncer for a while in san francisco and he lived at the end of the sketchiest alley you could ever imagine it was not a sex alley but it was just where bums went to shit mm. and one time i walked through it and a dude was getting his dick sucked after a night out at the club wow and uh so it was a multi-purpose alley shit and blow and was that the first public sex act like homeless sex act that you had come upon you know i think they had homes uh but uh I don't think I've seen homeless sex. Mm. Oh, I, we, we had a store for a couple of years down in Skid Row. There was one day I'm just driving down the street and I just sort of like get distracted. I'm looking over and I see a dude fucking a chick from behind uh -huh. and she's sucking another dude's dick. <sighs> and like when you think about how rare three ways are in the real world mm -hmm. to see one taking place in, in public. Uh -huh. That's like really, really unique and rare. Yeah, and especially, basically an Eiffel Tower is what you're describing. That's a frat move. Right. Maybe they were all ex-Arizona State <laughs> students and things just didn't work out for That's them. That's definitely a frat move, yeah. They worked at like Enterprise Rent-A-Car, their coke problem spiraled out of control, and now they're on heroin. Mm. Just reliving the glory days, man. Wait, so your hometown is where? Sacramento. Sacramento. Oh, my God. I didn't realize you were a SAC local. We've been interviewing all kinds of gangster rappers from SAC lately. SAC's on the come up, huh? Perhaps, but at the very least, they're uh, massacring each other, it would seem. And so we're trying to sort of dive in there and, and maybe slow some of that down. They're actually killing each other? The gang war in Sacramento is insane. Fuck. Yeah. What's going on? What's must, the root must, of it? Must be nice for you to just sort of uh, not have to deal with all that, huh? Do <laughs> I look like the guy who gets caught up in gang war politics? <laughs> Do you think about joining the gang early no, on? No, I'm, that wasn't I'm, really part of your life? I'm, I mean, it was either go to college or become a blood. Mm. And... <laughs> I went left. <laughs> uh, didn't take the other fork. Yeah, SAC, I'm curious about the gang wars, but there's definitely a feel to people who come out of SAC. Like, I know your background's BMX. I grew up skating. Right. And uh, the, the SAC guys, like John Cardiel and Miles Silvis, they're very proud of where they come from. And there are so few of them that they stand out. Right. They have their own unique vibe. And SAC spots are always sick to see in videos. Yeah. Like my elementary school got hit. Right. In, a, in a, like an alien workshop video. And you just lost your fucking mind. I was fucking psyched, dude. Yeah. I grew up my whole life in Nashua, New Hampshire, wondering like what it would be like to see a pro come ride like the, the shitty rail that we rode every day. And then like one time I saw a guy come and like grind that four stair rail. And it was like the greatest day in 1998 for yeah. me. Like I could not fucking believe what I had just witnessed. Yeah. How big is BMX these days relative to skateboarding? Skateboarding is probably like 100 times bigger, I would guess. Damn. Yeah. How many guys are making retirement money off BMX? Somewhere in the realm of zero, I would assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's the dude who killed himself? Great. Dave Mira? Dave Mira did off himself, yeah. I remember I was in Argentina and super drunk in this club and this guy just comes up to me and he's like teary-eyed and he knows who I am and he grabs me and he's just... Dave Mira killed himself. And I'm drunk as fucking Argentina for some reason. Just like, are you fucking kidding me? You're going to hit me with that shit? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to have a good time out here. I mean, I was probably going to find out on my phone sooner or later there. But What were you doing in Argentina? We were just on a bike trip back in the day. You were legit, huh? You're doing trips. This isn't about me. This is about you. One thing I find interesting is that 
you're like so clearly immersed in like pop punk and indie rock and shit and that your videos don't have anything to do with that but then you're like frequently just like reminding me that like you know who the smiths are with the background music and whatnot which for me mm -hmm. that is astounding to me is that i feel like i have almost the exact same list of like indian pop, pop punk bands mm -hmm. that i listened to during my youth that mm -hmm. you frequently use in your videos mm -hmm. which kind of freaks me out yeah, I grew up. You're gonna tell me the editor picked it all, and you don't, no. never heard any no, of these no, bands. No, no, <laughs> no. I just for me, I was a kid. Like the first ten years of your life don't matter. You don't mm. remember those. So it's ten through twenty, which is your formative year for mm. the music you get into, the sports you like, and during that time, it was like 2000 to 2003. They call it like the pop punk mm. explosion, like the skater takeover where My Chemical Romance was huge. Mm. Taking Back Sunday was something they played in the quad during lunch at your high school. Yeah. And uh, that was just the stuff I gravitated towards. And you look like the singer of All American Rejects. Anybody ever tell you that? That guy's a model, isn't he? Is he? Yeah, I think so. I think that guy dabbles in modeling. So that's a compliment. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to collect my thoughts right here. But I had a thought recently about what I used to think was good music and shitty music. I thought, fucking My Chemical Romance, Taking Back Sunday, those are my guys, brand new, fuck yeah. And then the cheerleaders would all be, I remember us like Grand Theft Autumn by Fall Out Boy came on like, in the quad at lunch, and I saw the cheerleaders mouthing the lyrics, where is your boy tonight? And I thought, these fucking sellout poser chicks, they like such shitty music. And nowadays, the pop culture music girls are into like, would make me think, like if they were listening to Fall Out Boy now, I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. Fucking right. chicks have great taste. But now they're listening to like Madison Beer uh, or fucking, I don't know. Addison Ray. Addison Ray. <laughs> yeah. Or Jake Paul's new single. Or literally whatever TikTok tells them to listen to. Yeah. 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 That's interesting that My Chemical Romance was hardcore enough for you, but that Fall Out Boy was a little too commercial. Because that, for me, I liked like, uh, you know, I was into like Limp Biscuit and Corn and shit. And then by the time that like I, that like Slipknot came out, mm -hmm. I was already like going down the like punk and hardcore rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And I was like, these dudes in mass, this is gay. I don't want anything to do with this. Yeah. Well, Slipknot is objectively kind of gay. <laughs> I mean, they wear fucking masks. My girlfriend, I, I think you told me this, Mia. She told me recently, she's like, I, I heard the lead singer of Slipknot got abused when he was a kid. I was like, well, no <laughs> shit. He's walking around in a scarecrow mask on stage next to a guy wearing a pumpkin. Right. Obviously, this guy got molested. I would have assumed probably something along those lines. Yeah. Limp Biscuit's hilarious, though. Like, mm. I, my buddies and I, we still listen to Limp Biscuit like it's a Richard Pryor album. We mm. put it on when we want to fucking laugh because the lyrics are just deliciously juicy right and douchey he has a song on chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water which is the actual name of the album yeah. some people might not know that yeah. and uh with chocolate starfish it just means an asshole it's just a code name for asshole but there's a song where he just says fuck like 56 times and mm. counts them throughout the song right that's entertainment and it's no wonder they sold like 50 billion records to sixth graders during, during this weird window where it was like okay to mix metal and, and rap for mm -hmm. a little while before mm -hmm. people but i feel like that like set back the combination of those two things by like 20 years where it, it was mm -hmm. like nobody wanted to do anything that really like mixed the two yeah. for a long time afterwards yeah it's it's so strange how some things are completely not credible some genres mm. and then some have all this cred like progressive rock that has no credibility like pink floyd a lot of the critics don't like very much but the ramones like everybody's just jerking off to them like these guys are geniuses this is the best music even though they only use three chords the same with rap rock mm. rap rock has zero credibility right and all those bands we look at is i mean look at fred durst the guy is a fucking douche but he is I, fried yeah <laughs> but i can look back at that shit now and be like why did I so quickly write that off? Like, why did I, by the time I was like 14 and a half, I was like so quick to write off the music that I sincerely loved at 12. Mm -hmm. And that seems kind of strange to me because I would never, I, but I feel like that's normal for kids. But also I feel like part of growing up is realizing that if you ever sincerely enjoyed anything, that it's part of you for life and you should not try to write off that era. Like mm -hmm. if, if you enjoyed a YouTube channel or enjoyed a comedian, et cetera, at a certain point in your life, mm -hmm. and then you outgrow it, Mm -hmm. You should still be able to go back to that and acknowledge that era and be able to do the sort of reconnaissance work to figure out why you appreciate it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I just went back and I was listening to Linkin Park. Speaking of rap rock, their mm -hmm. first album, 
the thing is sick. Really? And there are so many lyrics that you don't understand when you're a young kid that you go back to once your vocabulary and your life experience is expanded, and they mean something totally new. Mm. Like that first Linkin Park album I listened to is clearly, it, it makes perfect sense that the guy Chester, their lead singer, killed himself because that is just a struggle with depression. Right. That whole album. And it's somebody myself i mean i think everybody in this industry deals with anxiety to some level uh -huh. and listening to the song paper cut that opens that album i was like holy shit i didn't appreciate i loved the song when i was a kid but now i appreciate it as an adult right. because i felt what this song is describing yeah because i was you know a big rock fan and a big rap fan but then as a, a rock fan at a certain point as i'm getting more into metal and hardcore and stuff i completely like Linkin Park just went in the bucket of bands that I wasn't paying attention to or fucking with because mm -hmm. it seemed really, you know, mainstream and mm -hmm. corny or whatever. And then all of a sudden, Jay Z is doing an album with Linkin Park, mm -hmm. and I have to then like make sense of those facts in my head because it's like even at you know seventeen, I got it that Jay Z was the the guy. Like he's the best rapper. He's the best rapper from New York. He's just destroyed Nas in this battle. He's the god, and he's choosing to fuck with Linkin Park, and I'm having to like make sense of that mm -hmm. because to me it made no sense because to me hate breed is the best rock band now and this was like very much before where now i feel like it's kind of normal to be appreciative of a bunch of different genres of, of aggressive music at, at that age that just seems so foreign to me it's like i really had to pick a camp like are you a death metal guy are you a mm -hmm. hardcore guy are you a ska kid mm -hmm. were you a ska kid i went to a couple ska shows the scene was whack those guys got no pussy huh and that's in, in high school. I basically navigated everything by is this choice going to get me pussy or not? And mm. going to a ska show wasn't adding up to pussy. But I think when I would go to the ska shows back then, there were a lot of girls because it's such non threatening music. Like that's true. when I go to hardcore shows, I'm like, yo, like girls who go to this, like you, you have to have been through some serious trauma to want to be a part of this Absolutely. scene. Absolutely. You know, you're getting people jumping on your head. When you see girls in the mosh pit, yeah. I'm like psychoanalyzing hard. Like, what, what, what happened to you that made you want to do this? That was such a strange scene because I got into that too, the local hardcore scene. Right. And I don't know if that still exists. I don't know if kids wait in line. And it wasn't just the kids with dyed black hair. Again, mm. it was jocks. Right. Football kids would start going to see the Black Dahlia murder when they <laughs> rolled through Sacramento or job right. for a cowboy. Yeah. And, um, the casual fans weren't the thing. The weird thing to me was going to those shows at these churches or these little cafes was the local scene kids who evaluate themselves on their dance moves in the hardcore pit, uh -huh. like their two-step and their hardcore dancing. And if any kids come from out of town, there's going to be <laughs> gang violence, essentially. About the dancing, though. Like, this guy, dude, this fucker thinks he can two-step. He's from Reno. I'm going to beat the shit out of him. Yeah. Or that this guy fucking stage-dived in Clinton. He's dead in the parking lot. Yeah, I think... A big part of my interest in hardcore at that time was my fascination with what was going on in the mosh pit and the weird politics. Like where if a kid got in the mosh pit and he's wearing a tie dye shirt and he's got mm -hmm. long hair, it's like almost a hundred percent chance that someone is going to intentionally knock him out. Yeah, which is really kind of counterintuitive to the logic of punk and hardcore being about like, you know, doing good stuff, getting along. Yeah, I, guess. I don't know. Was anyone even really pretending that that was like the overwhelming ethos? I don't know. I mean, that's fucking everything in life, right? Yeah. I mean, there's just so much hypocrisy. Like, oh, we stand together as a scene. I don't like this guy's fucking hat. He's going down <laughs> or whatever in politics. It's yeah. like fucking we stand for the American people. We're going to take care of you, pay for your education. And then we shoot a fucking predator drone into Iraq and kill a baby and his fucking family. Right. Oh, man, dude, I am hung over right now, Adam. <laughs> I got to say, we, uh, my girlfriend and I woke up just blacked out coming home. We went to, that was like my first YouTube party. Oh, really? Yeah, I had to Where sign, at? It oh. was down at Nelk's uh, compound. Okay. I had to sign an NDA, so I can't really talk much about it, but uh, and, uh, I did. What Logan. was your overall impression, though? You enjoyed it? Yeah, it was sweet, man. L Logan Paul uh, did fuck me. He, so that's the one thing I'll, I'm going to say. You're just surrounded by influencers <laughs> at every turn. Is that like more enjoyable than going to like a bar for you at this point? Um, it wasn't really that big. This uh -oh. was pretty fucking mellow. Okay. It was more just a little celebration because they did a merch drop. But I don't, I go to bed so early that I don't go out. But I'm trying to think the most enjoyable place for me to drink. I, a day drinking, probably. You like that. Yeah. The bars fucking suck, especially I, in LA. Yeah. They're probably loaded with like tech shitheads. 
and like white collar professionals. I don't want to deal with that. I feel like most of the bars that I have gone to in my life, like in particular when I lived in Long Beach and then I lived in like Koreatown, which where I like essentially never went out drinking and stuff. But I never seen like tech bros at bars. For me, mostly you see like alcoholics and people who are looking to find cocaine. That's like the main demographic in mm -hmm. LA. Yeah, they're the only bar experience I have is there's a karaoke bar by my house that my roommates are obsessed with. Really? I have this roommate, Noah, who would go there and they would, they had their repertoire of songs. He would always do the Thousand Miles by like whatever her fucking face is. Right. The chick from the early 2000s. Who I smoke. And then uh, that's the remix. There's a like version of that song that's about murdering other people in Florida. That was based on that sample. That's I, th I think I'm surprised she let them use that. It I'm sounds not like, sure if it was consensual or not. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like rape uh, sampling because I don't think the message of that song is anything to do with murdering. If people. she had any idea what that song was about, then she would not have officiated mm -hmm. this in any way. Yeah, but my my roommate would go to these bars. They always go, and then he would. Like nine times out of ten, come back and get a chick to lick his ass after this bar. Really? There's there's something about this place. There's something in the floorboards or something in the drinks they serve. It would just always happen. Right. And then they would fucking come through. They'd stumble back home at two a.m. while I'm trying to sleep. His door would open and then close, and then I would hear like a <laughs> the the ass licking noise. Like hey, fucking, but you knew it was his ass. Man, right? <laughs> I've been completely exaggerating, but <laughs> that's the only bar. I don't really go out in L.A., but that's the one bar I know about is that bar. And that's going on there. I wish that when you looked up the Yelp review of a bar that it would have like a general estimate of what percentage of people are down to eat ass in that bar. Yeah. On any given night. Yeah, I, I think that'd be important. And I think if people are down to eat ass, that means just your chances of getting laid are probably good, too. Right. We uh, we were having an interesting conversation. Uh, the girl over there with, with my girlfriend, which I don't think she wants me to say her name especially if she's gonna make out with house phone too i guess we'll give her that we'll give her anonymity until then yeah but uh we were talking about this she loves to uh y you like to uh, you're not on camera right is this okay okay we were talking about penis size mm. and if it counts she thinks it doesn't count if a guy has under a five inch dick or if she wears a condom which mm. is insane logic, but I guess the small dick thing might work out because you are putting less mileage on your pussy right. for every inch down you are from average. Right. So if it is a two or three inch cock, I mean, it's pretty much like inserting a tampon. Right. And I'll give you that. You right. can cross that off your list. I know, but that, that's an interesting point is like, a dick that is the size of a finger. Like, if you heard a girl like, fuck 500 guys, you think of her a certain <laughs> way. But if you heard she got fingered by 500 guys, I mean, you might still wonder if there's something going on that led her to that scenario. But, I mean, that has got to be part of it is that when, when people judge a porn star, which is something I'm frequently annoyed by, mm -hmm. that people basically, like, thinking that girls who do porn are going to have super worn out, crazy, loose vaginas. Yeah. Like, as if having sex with, like, one guy over and over and over is so different than just fucking a bunch of guys yeah. doing porn. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing about that is that, like, yeah, fucking a, a 10, 12-inch dick a couple times would probably do way more damage to the vagina to the extent that that's a real thing than fucking one four-inch dick for the rest of your life. <laughs> you might never know how gauged out your shit could potentially be. Gauged out. Yeah. It, one of those scene kids that we would see in the pits, their the ears, ear. <laughs> it's a good representation of a girl's vagina if she's getting banged by a 10, 12-inch dick. Yeah. I mean, I've had... One of the tightest vaginas I ever had sex with was like a 45-year-old woman who had children. Wow. And I think if a baby's getting pushed through that hole, even a 10-inch dick's not going to be doing too much damage to it. It's just so it. genetic, I think. I don't think it has nearly as much to do with like how many dicks have been in there so much as a genetic thing, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, genetic tightness, vagina tightness, sure. I wanted to ask you, how the fuck did you end up dating a girl who's like just turned 21? No offense to her. I guess maybe she's a little older now, but I watched the video of you giving her shit on her birthday, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, this seems kind of bizarre. Like For me, I personally would not... I, I'm not sure what it would be like to date somebody that much younger than me, but how's, yeah. how's this going for you? I'm 31. Uh, well, so it's not nearly as weird as me being 37, but it's still interesting. Yeah, yeah. Me. It's 10 years, which is, that's nothing if you're an actor in Hollywood and you're 50 and your wife is 40. Right. But at my age, yeah, it's a little. But she's probably like never seen The Simpsons. Have you seen The Simpsons? She enjoys. But she like the knows what the Simpsons is. She never seen it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. <laughs> well, this, I mean, the Simpsons have been garbage since the '90s. So it's five seasons, and we act like it's this classic shit. Yeah, I'm gonna this little window. Exactly. Yeah, four through nine is the golden age. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there are. I, 
I mean, obviously I love her and I, I don't, it's not a bad thing being with her, but I, I, my parents, she recently came home to Sacramento with me to meet my parents for the first time. And I wonder if they're getting creeped out by her being 21. They certainly didn't say anything about it. Right. And, um, I think my mom might've heard us having sex too. Wow. When she was putting shit away in the laundry hamper right. in the middle of the night. So if she was going to say something, she would have, I'm trying to think if there's anything strange about it. I mean, she's about to graduate college, and once she's graduated, it's going to be pretty fucking like normal. The age right. isn't going to be a factor. I guess in my mind, because at some point over the past couple of years, I had a baby, stopped drinking. Yeah. And so to me, like when I think about what the average 21-year-old girl's life is like, yeah. it's hard for me to imagine being on the same page as them because of the fact that... You know, most twenty-one-year-old girls I know are basically concerned with like going to the club and like yeah, fucking some rapper. I guess not that no offense to her, but she fucks rappers. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I let her do that. It's a <laughs> free pass. One rapper per month. He doesn't even have to be good if he can just freestyle half-assedly in the club. Homeless guy rapping on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she can fuck him. It's, it's basically open in that case. That's hot. No, I mean she just um, when we first met. I would go party with her at UC Santa Barbara, which again, I'm just creeping myself out talking about this. Like, what's up, guys? You guys smoke reefer? Let's do some shots. But I, I'm buying. I feel like you kind of like read young. Like, I'm six years older than you, but I feel like I read older. Like, I definitely don't feel like I would fit in at this hypothetical college party. Yeah, you have tattoos. You also, mm. you look more masculine Great and mature beard, than me. Yeah. You look good, man. Um, no. Yeah, she, I mean, when we first met, she was definitely sloppy and getting fucked up, and I didn't know the real her. But then since we've been hanging out more, our interests have synced up more. Like, her and mm. I meditate together and work out together and read together, and she doesn't get offended by the horrible things I say in videos and in real life. Right. And um, she occasionally lets me uh, fuck female jazz artists. That's how we're... Did you really? No. I'm just, oh, she doesn't let you fuck anybody just, or what? I'm just hung over trying to make shitty jokes. She's right got now. you on a leash like that. You can't just fuck a fan. I feel like that's a, that's not on your Patreon or to fuck a fan. <laughs> you can just that, fuck a fan. That could be tier. profitable. I I mean I think anybody who's taking me up on that is not going to be enjoyable for me to fuck, and I'd have to get hammered. I'm not really worried about you enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be for the right price. I was telling her yesterday. We were talking about. Um, there was some fucking fat girl we saw on TV, and I was like, "Would you uh, would you let me fuck her for ten thousand dollars? Then we split it." And if you think about it, with a condom on, according to her over there, that doesn't count. First mm -hmm. of all, but also you could just jerk yourself off to the point of climax, slip it in real quick, technically finish inside, and be out. So you do that to the fan who pays you. You could do that to a fat girl. Mm. The question really is like, what is sex at this at that point? Because mm. uh, like doing OnlyFans content with my girl, it just strikes me that when we fuck a girl together, it is so profoundly different than like every girl I ever fucked in my life mm. prior to that. Because there's no song and dance. There's no getting to know them. There's no going to the bar. There's no anything. It's just I walk into the room. She's giving me head. We fuck and then. After that, that's it. Have you guys had any problems, you and your girl, with jealousy after those threesomes happen? In the early, early days when we first started to do it, like we would be getting drunk. And mm -hmm. then that got weird like once or twice where like either I was drunk enough to not be uh, properly sharing the attention mm -hmm. or you like, would just be fucking the other chick and she'd yeah, be mad. maybe a little too long mm -hmm. and not acknowledging my girl or my girl would like be the drunker one mm -hmm. and she would just sort of be like fucking yeah this is this pissing me off all of a sudden for yeah. some reason so back then yes but now that it's all business no and then would you meet these chicks at bars out in public because i feel like that would be an issue too if you're just hitting on chicks that you're drinking with we did that a few times but for the most part no it's pretty much always been like sex workers only fans girls or like we just knew them before and it's weird now because at first we were just hooking up with girls because we were out partying mm -hmm. and that was just what we we're doing and then over time it became like there are girls that we hooked up with early on that we didn't bother to film mm -hmm. that and i she knows this because she sees her fucking only fans messages but we probably would have made outlandish amounts of money if we had filmed those threesomes mm -hmm. and we just weren't even thinking about it so now it's much more like like tomorrow like we have it booked like i'm doing a podcast with this girl mm -hmm. and then we have a hotel room after and we're gonna go fuck for the only fans and then whatever that's just part of the day you know yeah yeah, her, my girlfriend and I, we had something like a threesome recently in a hot tub when we were just fucked up. This chick was predatorial and basically just made her way into our midst. And I say predatorial as if I was threatened physically. Like, no. no, that's 
I'm a fucking you. You can't rape a dude. It's all right, basically, and, uh, unless it's man on man. I thought Terry in, in prison. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was ridiculous, huh? That was fucking bullshit. The guy who tried to uh, put out that he got molested or had got his ass grabbed at a party. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for me personally, I'm I'm like, are you fucking serious? Oh yeah, it was complete bullshit. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine, but I'm not an actor, so I don't know how much industry dick he's used to sucking. Not literal mm-hmm. dick, but like, yeah. I feel like in that world. There's so much pressure to conform mm-hmm. that, hey, maybe some guy's rubbing your leg and you're just going to let him. Yeah. You ever thought about that? If a producer, if like a Harvey Weinstein, like a modern day, mm-hmm. tried to like rub up on you, you let him suck you off or something for a role? I had to blow Adam to get on the podcast. <laughs> no, I... Yeah, uh, you did. Dude, I, I, for the right price tag and for the right job, like who fucking knows what I would do? Mm. I, with a man, I had a guy when I lived in San Francisco, I was at a restaurant. This guy said he was a photographer and he was going to take some pictures of me. And my comedy writing career was just starting out then. So I was eager to get pictures taken. I could use them on my website, I thought, on my social media. And then the first time we hung out, it became very clear that this was just an old gay guy who was going to try to take me out to dinners and eventually fuck me. Right. And I think I took him up on two or three dinners before it got way too creepy. Like, I came over to his house after jujitsu one time because we were going to go to a sushi restaurant. Dude, he was trying to sniff my jock strap. But Wait, why do you want to hang out with this guy if you know he's gay and wants to fuck you? Because it was free fucking sushi in San Francisco, man. That's a hundred and twenty dollar bill. But you were really like at that point in your life where it's like, damn, this dinner is worth it. Yeah, it I'll was, get flirted with. I, you know what? It's it's pretty embarrassing to say, but I think some part of me at that point was insecure, and I kind of liked that this old guy wanted my cock. You're like Mac from It's Always Sunny. I have never seen oh. It's Always Sunny, so I don't get that reference. Right. But basically, like he, he he's well, early on, it's like he's not gay, but it's like he wants the attention from this trans person so bad that he's just rolling with it. But then I think ultimately he is revealed as actually being sincerely gay. So I don't know. yeah, I um, I mean, I never came around and obviously did anything with this fucking guy, but I think part of me did like it. Like, we would go out to restaurants. We would get the VIP booths wow. in places. He knew all the chefs. So, yeah, I, I'm glad I cut that off before I got down a road that I couldn't turn around and, and drive out of. So you can see how it happens, that you could have become this guy's plaything. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> fucking, uh, I mean, I was working at a restaurant, right. and I hated the fucking job. Like a five-star San Francisco restaurant, the kind of place where your manager is screaming at you nightly, mm. where the chefs will physically assault you if you fuck up while delivering food. Right. So, yeah, if that guy was like, hey, man, 20 grand a month, I'm just, you're going to get really drunk, I'm just going to enter you once isn't, with a condom. And isn't that crazy that that's what, like, every girl in LA lives with is mm-hmm. the knowledge that they could very easily basically quit their job and still have their rent paid and all their expenses paid mm-hmm. just by fucking some creepy ass old 60 year old man or whatever I'm sure mm-hmm. it's, I'm sure the sugar baby game is a little harder than I'm making it sound but I mean that's right there as mm-hmm. an option for yeah. pretty much every girl right yeah absolutely and there's not the stigma of having to overcome your sexuality like there is for us I mean it's way harder for a guy to fucking get fucked for money it's be- his self-respect, everything in society tells him not to do that. Yeah. But for a chick, it's not that big of a deal. Right. And I um, I don't know. Do you? How many girls do you know that have been doing stuff like that? It's weird because they won't tell me, but then my girl will tell me about shit that she knows about, basically as in how many chicks are doing the sugar daddy thing. Mm-hmm. And it is astounding yeah. how many chicks are, are, are doing this in L.A., mm-hmm. which I, it makes me wonder how common it is in other parts of America. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely like a weirdly pervasive thing. And, and like, you know, we the more public version of that is girls who have OnlyFans mm-hmm. and making shitloads of money off that. But then the slightly more low key version is the girls who are like going out on dates with 60 year old man mm-hmm. and fucking him in the bathroom, whatever. Yeah, it sounds awful. I mean, when I was hanging out with this guy going to sushi, the conversations were excruciating. You know, I actually showed him a picture of my dick once. That was pretty gay. I don't know why. I was insecure about my cock size at that point. My cock's like, when it's rock hard, it's six inches, maybe a little bit more, but it's not very girthy, and it looks terrible. So the conversation about the four-inch dick kind of hits close to home because you're like, damn, I'm like right near there. Yeah. Like, that would suck to find out that none of the dick you've ever given on your whole life mattered. Yeah, maybe every girl I've had sex with doesn't consider it sex. 
yeah. or it's a coin flip because I'm right there on that barrier of does it count or not count. But <laughs> I was insecure about my cock, so I showed this gay guy my dick like for some affirmation, and he started being so weird after I showed him my dick. He's like, oh, that's hot. What do I have to do to get you to send me that photo? <laughs> and he started getting real fucking creepy. Oh and then he God. showed me my cock, and of course, or he showed me his cock over a photo, and of course, it was just a fucking hog. Really? Yeah, and I've seen your cock too, Adam. I don't really like <laughs> it. Yours doesn't make me feel very good either. It's big cock guys. Really, They really piss me off too. And uh, we have a buddy. We have this dude in our squad who's, who's fucking a legend. His name's King Croc. Mm-hmm. He's um, King Croc BBC is his actual Instagram handle. And he's an African-American gentleman. And he showed me his dick in Yosemite after we just jumped in a freezing river. Mm. And I saw it. I was like, oh, that looks like fucking my cock. Right. Yes, because for years and, and maybe even decades, I've grappled with the question, do all black men have larger penises than white men? Mm. And I thought maybe this is some evidence that we're all the same. Right. But then recently we did a bit where a buddy of ours who's like 18 years old and super Christian and homophobic he thought he was going to be painting a hot girl model she came over in her robe and was like alright you ready to see me naked I'm just going to go into this room right here and change for you baby she goes into our garage and then King Croc's in there getting his dick hard he pops out the door and shows our buddy his fucking throbbing black giant cock right it got three times four times bigger than i thought it was going to be once it was aroused and not fresh out of cold water right and that fucking hurt me i was like okay so there we go now black men all do have big dicks every gay guy i'm on a dinner date with has a big dick Mm -hmm. every podcast host i'm working with his cock is literally twice as big as mine and i'm getting paranoid man i feel like there is there's a social movement waiting to happen basically like to free the black men with small dicks because there's a lot of black guys out there who i think that that stereotype kind of does a little bit of damage to their their a ton because they think that this this is the stereotype is that every black guy is a huge dick i know for a fact Mm -hmm. this is not true yeah i'm not really like seeing any of the small dicks but i've heard that they exist yeah but that is kind of like this uh stereotype that i think some guys got to live with you know dude imagine how awful that would be because as a white guy having an average or even a small cock i mean i'm sure it's not the best thing in the world Mm. well i'm actually i'm saying as if i don't know what it's like (laughs) um but it's kind of expected, especially me. I'm like a tall, skinny guy. Nobody's expecting mm. me to pull out a Danny D, Johnny Sin style piece. Mm. But if you're a black guy, like that must be really fucking hard. Right. Every time you go home with a girl, she is expecting something. Mm. It's awful. It's like being Jewish and every girl you go out on a date with expects you to have your fucking 401k maxed out to right. be driving a Bentley. You're like, I'm the other kind of Jew. Yeah, I'm broke ex- as hell. <laughs> Jews, it, it is a strange thing with Jews. They're either in dental school or they're working at Goldman Sachs or they're like broke comedy writers or stand-up comedians mm. sleeping on a couch in LA. But you think that those broke stand-up comedy guy, writer guys, that they like secretly have a parent who's like kind of bankrolling this experiment? It's likely. Yeah, it's, it's definitely likely. You know, it's a weird thing that I see now is that people will be calling other people out for like their old tweets in which they employed the Jewish stereotype of Jews having money mm-hmm. and stuff. And it's like, that's weird to me to call them out for that because every Jewish person I have ever known has mm-hmm. happily basically agreed with that stereotype yeah. that like, yes, like that's our culture. We're good mm-hmm. with money. Yeah. And that, like, that making that assumption is now mm-hmm. considered offensive. It's just, that's interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's weird right now. The um, the way oppression and like uh, trying to figure out who's more oppressed and who's less oppressed. Mm. Like Asians and Jews now are like at the top of society when they used to be, say, fifty years ago, treated like garbage. Here, mm. it's just so confusing. I think with the Jews, it's just their emphasis on family and education. Mm. Like they're just they run their family like a military operation, right? And they they are very selective about who they marry and reproduce with too, right? Like almost to a creepy extent. Like I have a buddy who's a Persian Jew. He has to find another other Persian Jew right. to marry. And he's a, he's a fucking scumbag. He'll have sex with whomever. But when it comes to marriage, it has to be a Persian Jew. Right. And I guess there aren't that many of them. So it's almost incestuous what's going on. Well, I think it's literally incestuous in some cases. Like For sure. Not maybe here where everybody's moved here from different places. But like when you go to like, if you look at like a city or a small community, mm-hmm. like a religious community, I never thought about this. And then one day somebody like 
said that and they're like oh yeah like sir, a lot of these like deeply religious communities have huge problems with inbreeding mm-hmm. and i actually looked it up myself and i'm like oh yeah that is a real fucking thing because when you have so much pressure on you to marry within your your community of course everybody ends up being related to mm-hmm. each other at some point yeah there are some very jewish communities in los angeles too where like just um just south of wilshire i think i was at my buddy's house and there was some holy holiday for them recently on saturday i think Uh and you feel like you're in bethlehem (laughs) or in fucking tel aviv or something walking around people have like big round hats and everybody's wearing suits and walking around owning the store on melrose you would kind of constantly get that insane juxtaposition where you know there's 30 guys with their hair dyed smoking backwoods in front of my store and like 10 guys doing kick flips and there's some guy playing with a kendama etc etc and then you just have a fucking traditional Jewish family that would have probably looked exactly the same in like mm-hmm. 1950 mm-hmm. and they're just like walking by completely ignoring mm-hmm. everybody like like two completely opposite worlds times just coexisting and I'm sure that they were probably less happy about the coexistence than the other people but you know. yeah well they I mean the guys who are skating around probably don't appreciate this I, yeah I feel like most of those people are like we're probably pretty oblivious to the fact that this family was even walking by uh, I know that area though you're talking about Melrose like that's exactly where they live in these beautiful fucking houses Mm -hmm. where in LA are you looking uh we live in the valley okay around here there's the general area yeah it's um it's fucking Burbank how do you feel about uh being out in this general like valley area well, I can say that after having uh, multiple attempts on my life through doing podcasts at the store on Melrose, mm-hmm. that this is a lot more low pressure. I really mm-hmm. appreciate like being able to like walk out to my car here and mm-hmm. not have to worry about some kid with green hair fucking asking me to listen to SoundCloud or whatever. Mm-hmm. So at this point, yeah, that's one thing I noticed from watching your videos is like, wow, this guy interacts with his fans on a completely different level that I would never feel comfortable with yeah. because I'm just very aware that some percentage of my fans, shout out to y'all, are absolutely out of their fucking mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's getting like that to me too. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's um it's fucking tough to deal with, man. I, when I started out, and I'm sure you can relate to this too, you try to respond to every message and answer every mm. comment, but eventually you'll fucking lose your mind because yeah. there's this like ripening period as a, an, an influencer, or a creator, or a podcaster, where at first everybody fucking loves you mm-hmm. up until you hit 100,000 subscribers, 100,000 Instagram followers. And then when you get past that, there starts to be hate, mm-hmm. hate, hate, hate. And people start wanting to tear you down and you'll just lose your mind if you read it. I haven't, I haven't reached the violence phase that you've gotten mm-hmm. to yet. So I'm looking forward to that. But do you feel like you've finally hit that wall where it's like, it's like you can be a comedian or a YouTuber for a a certain period of time but then once you get big enough then it becomes a thing where the people who don't like you actually take issue with you existing yeah. where if you have 10,000 or 20,000 followers and yeah. your little fan base then nobody considers it important enough mm-hmm. obviously the underlying issue is also that you're a, a cloud opportunity at a certain point like yeah. if, you, if you can't get views making a video attacking mm-hmm. somebody then there's really no point to yeah. a lot of people right yeah no that the thing you're talking about them taking issue with you existing that's starting to happen a little bit people Mm. message my girlfriend and tell my girlfriend about a new chick i followed or a picture i liked Mm. on instagram of a girl with her tits out people actively trying to sabotage my relationships people trying to leak my address on reddit that's that sort of stuff is starting to happen right where people just want as bad of things to happen to me as possible leaking my sister's address my parents address see that's intense right there it's tough man i guess um just a lot of young men that we appeal to, and we probably appeal to disillusioned, pissed off young guys also, right. a certain percentage of them. I mean, most of them are cool as fuck. But even if it's half a percent of those guys, if they're fucking psycho, that's a lot of people. Uh, and that's a lot of, and they spend a lot of time fucking with us. Right. It is weird because when I look at your fan base, I'm like, it seems like a little bit more grown up, sort of like, you know, to, to even be into comedy, you have to have a certain level of intelligence yeah. i feel like whereas to be an aspiring rapper mm-hmm. you can totally have a 40 iq mm-hmm. and that that's just fine and that's just like whatever so sometimes i feel like there is an effect where your fan base is like a little bit more like nuanced when you were trying to find somewhere to stay in new york uh you like meet up with like a pretty normal guy like yeah. right away and i'm like oh that seems like a, a comedy fan mm-hmm. like a relatively normal guy with a job and an apartment mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess they have more ability to do damage, though, because while they're not going to punch you as you're walking out to your car, Mm. they will fucking 
blow up a shot where your credit card is out in a video and figure out how to sharpen the image to read the number and then they will go on like a spending spree with your funds right they'll do this machiavellian shit like that mm. and they're i think they're a little bit more dangerous than a quote-unquote lower iq fan base i could see that not that i think that my audience is like largely lower iq i sure. just when i think about like the crazy shit that happens from time to time mm -hmm. it's like oh that makes sense to me when you think about it in the fact that like mm -hmm. some pretty like dumb people might end up being you know, wanting to be a rapper it's like the kind sure. of thing that somebody who's out of their mind would possibly want to mm -hmm. gravitate towards let me ask you this so you're all like skating and being into music and shit through high school what happens after that like how do you eventually land on being a youtuber yeah uh, well, uh, it's, it's I, I can short it down. Oh, sorry. I'm, I don't. I'm. Tr I can't tell now if I'm hungover or I'm drunk from the numb rum. It's probably getting you drunk again, which is probably a good thing because your hungover brain is craving alcohol right now. Absolutely. This yeah. is a scary name, numb rum. Numb too. rum. I know. Um, it sounds like a Xanax. I, I haven't stood up yet, so I haven't really felt the effects, but I, I think it's getting to me. Yeah. So I, if the first thing I did was jujitsu, that was mm. my big thing after skateboarding, and I wanted to be a jujitsu coach. Which is funny because there's no fucking money in it, right? Coaching, there can be. Okay. But it's just, it's one of those lives where if your jujitsu coach dies tomorrow, there's no real loss to the world. Right. It's what we do. I mean, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but it feels like we are reaching a lot of people and we're doing something creative where just like the, this fucking the main street jujitsu coach is baby. He's a babysitter. Essentially. No, if either of us died, hundreds of thousands of people would be upset. And if you're a jiu-jitsu coach and you die, it's like, what, you got like maybe a couple dozen people who yeah. are like working with you during that time. Obviously, there's your family and mm -hmm. stuff. But I think that is really what life is about is making as many people upset as possible when you die. I like the theory. Yeah, absolutely, man. Keep going. What, what belt did you get to? <laughs> purple. I'm still a purple. Okay. Yeah, I'm still training a little bit. I took like a lot of time off. Though. I saw the video where you uh, pretended to suck and uh, yeah. tapping the coach out or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, some quality stuff. That was fun. But I did that, and then I was teaching classes, and I remember one day I had to go in to teach a kid's class. One kid showed up. So I'm... Basically, if you walk by and I'm wrestling with one five-year-old, <laughs> you might call the cops if you poke your head into that fucking gym. So I realized right then I'm rolling around with kindergartners. This needs to stop. I, I felt like at that point I was 20 and I was in community college. I started to feel like I was missing out mm. on the college experience. I wanted to go get fucked up. I wanted the Eiffel Tower like those homeless people you saw in the alley. I, I wanted in on that. Bomb. <laughs> and then I also, I was like, you know what? Maybe I should go be a lawyer or a dentist or a professional and start making some money. I mean, right. everybody else does it. I must be pretty fucking cool. And I got, I went to UCLA. I transferred I like down here. like how all these things were on the table. Jiu-Jitsu coach, mm -hmm. party animal, mm -hmm. doctor. <laughs> absolutely all, yeah. and yeah that was the idea like i wanted to be a fucking like cool lawyer as if that fucking exists like mm -hmm. a guy who's like partying and having a great time and like going on vacations i didn't realize at that point that being a corporate attorney is fucking awful right my sister went down that road and she's trying to get out of it now but she's in a ton of student debt so it's a disaster mm -hmm. but yeah i went to ucla and i just didn't really like what i saw it's just constant one-upmanship and elitism Everybody on campus is obsessed with status. Uh, mm. Where's your internship? What frat are you in? Mm. Um, you're you're only in SAE. That's not a very cool house here. And then it start once they graduate college. It's just like, where do you work? Oh, that's not a very good investment bank. Uh, I, I can't talk to you. I can't oh date God. this guy. You so, made me so glad I didn't go to college. Well, I did for like a, a year of community mm -hmm. college, but basically, yeah. yeah. A community college honestly was more difficult to me than at UCLA too. UCLA is just a bunch of really smart professors who care about their research. They don't give a shit about teaching, so they just mm. they write that off just to cure the answers to the test you can study it the day before get a's i don't give a fuck okay. ucla was easy but i hated all these people and i just had an epiphany that i wanted to do something creative with writing so i'd always enjoyed that i'd been doing youtube style prank videos in high school and we would sell the dvds everybody had a phase where they were, were recreating jackass essentially mm. i i feel like that phase existed for a lot of guys I, if i had been born 10 years later and we like understood how to use video cameras a little bit better for sure like jackass was definitely like the thing when i or the tom green show was another mm -hmm. huge one it's mm -hmm. like i was thinking about that when i was watching your vlogs i'm like this all feels very fresh to me but i mean i can draw the line right back to like mm -hmm. tom green or jackass and that kind of stuff yeah. sure yeah and so i wanted to get back to that because 
when you're 20 or you're 21, 22, it's tough to just pick up a brand new skill at that part in your life. You don't really have enough time. Like mm. if you're 25, you can't pick up a guitar and be the next Jimi Hendrix or be the next Eddie Van Halen. Mm. You're just you're going to be 40 by the time you're great. And yeah. that's sort of too late to make it in a music career. So I wanted to use skills I developed and I'd always been a good writer and I'd been into creating comedy stuff. So I just picked that up. I stopped do I stopped caring about classes. I would cut school. I would just f- fucking bomb on all of my tests. And when I graduated, I figured out what pursuing the dream was really like, though. And it wasn't glamorous at all. I was mm. a bus boy going on sushi dates with an old gay guy. <laughs> that That's what the dream is like. It was fucking miserable. I was w- w- swabbing up puke in nightclubs right. as a bouncer. I was, I'd have to go out and uh, pick up a girl's shit because the bathroom line was too long and a girl went out back and just dropped one in the alley. Wow. Things like that. And I dealt with that for a long time. And I was trying to write comedic short stories. I wanted to be an actual writer, writer, like Mm. words on paper. But it's hard to find an audience like that because a YouTube video, you stumble across it, you watch it, you know if you like the person, you sampled their content and it took you 10 minutes. Right. To read something... That's an hour, two hour investment. And it's really hard to generate new fans. Once you start comparing all these different careers that basically involve you making content, you look at like YouTube and how easy it is to go viral on YouTube or TikTok or one of these platforms and then compare that to like writing a book yeah. or being even like a podcaster. Mm-hmm. The, the, the barrier you mm-hmm. have to get over to listen to somebody podcast for an hour sure. is very difficult. The barrier to get someone to mm-hmm. buy a book, like mm-hmm. if you're not already famous for something else, mm-hmm. the idea of making a living selling books, yeah. I mean, when you could just make YouTube content in mm-hmm. comparison, like mm-hmm. it just seems like the, the easiest decision ever. Is it? I don't think there's anything harder to get people to bite on than a book. In 2021? Yeah. If if we were having this conversation in like 1995, Mm -hmm. it probably still would have been pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, why would you write a book when you can make a TV show Mm -hmm. or a documentary or a movie or whatever? But Mm -hmm. in 2021, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's tough. It'd be a great fucking job. If you were James Patterson, you are Stephen King. Imagine how chill that fucking work day would be, though. Yeah. You wait, just do it wherever. You could live in Vegas or Arizona or a dirt cheap city. Yeah. Fucking right in your underwear. Just hang around, go on vacation, right on vacation. It would be sweet. But when I listen to video, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts about people's workflow of mm-hmm. authors and stuff, and it's it still seems quite difficult for even like a professional writer to yeah. sit down. They have to block off that couple hours in the mm-hmm. morning. To to sit down and write whereas like making a youtube video i feel like you or me if you just left me in a room with mm-hmm. a camera it's like that's what i'm going to gravitate towards mm-hmm. is filming and putting my ideas mm-hmm. on on film and mm-hmm. stuff like that like that's so mm-hmm. natural whereas i think writing is always going to have that degree of difficulty it's always going to be kind of torturous and it takes so long it might take you i mean i've heard of authors spending eight years james joyce spent like 20 years on his mm-hmm. last book finnegan's wake and that book finnegan's wake isn't even well received mm-hmm. whereas you and i turn on the mics, say some shit for a couple of hours, and then if it's good, great. If it's not good, you have next day to get it back and redeem yourself. Mm. It's I don't like spending that much time on content. But I did the writing thing, and I dropped a book, an ebook. And I, one of them was about getting jerked off at massage parlors. I went and toured a bunch of the Sacramento and Asian rub and tug places. That uh, he's getting excited for that because uh, he has a the you ever heard of the YouTubers the minorities mm-hmm. from yeah SAC? sack dudes they've done a lot of hand job content out there I believe as well hand job content it's a healthy niche <laughs> um, but I I did a book and I I put it out and it sold eight copies and I remember. And I had like a big email list. I had a bunch of friends. I thought it was going to do hundreds of copies. I thought I was going to be able to pay my electric bill at least that month, maybe my rent. It sold eight fucking copies. And I remember going to work at my shitty Jap- Japan town restaurant gig where I was a bus boy. And people would literally come into that restaurant that I went to college with uh-huh. who were now pulling up in Audis or Teslas. Ooh. And I am mopping tables in front of them with an apron on. And I remember that going on in that restaurant after my book sold eight copies and just thought, dude, you are fucking nothing right now. You are scum. Mm-hmm. You need to make a radical adjustment to your life immediately before it's too late. Right. And then within the span of about a year or two, I'd moved to L.A. and just gone all in on video content. And the idea was it was 
going to work or I was going to die. There was no backing out. I wouldn't be denied. And uh, that's still my mindset, man. That very much like makes me think about the period of my life before I started this podcast where it felt very life and death. Mm-hmm. Like my, my I, I, 2006, I started like the BMX blog, basically mm-hmm. like the first significant blog. Mm-hmm. And then that was my life for like 10 years. And then over time, it just kind of like started to really weigh on me. Like you're not even making as much money as you were a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. This industry clearly is in decline. Mm-hmm. Like you just have to figure this out. And I was just grasping at like all these different things, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I actually had a period of time where I was trying to be like a blogger and mm-hmm. I tried to write articles for a blog and like mm-hmm. tried to just really like about non BMX related topics. Yeah. I started just trying to like figure out anything I could write. And then mm-hmm. at the same time I was listening to a lot of podcasts and then slowly it started to like click in my brain. Like, Oh, like YouTube and podcasts podcasting are mm-hmm. the future writing blog posts is the past and mm-hmm. you have no fucking reason to pursue that at all mm-hmm. yeah yeah man i hope this stays the future i hope tiktok doesn't become the only acceptable form of art on the internet because i look at that shit and i hate it i hate the whole tiktok instagram story culture mm-hmm. but um I also don't want to be the guy who's clinging to blog writing in 2006 and refusing to accept video. Mm. But I, I feel like this is a pretty timeless thing we're doing. I mean, radio has been big forever. It's hard to imagine what the future past YouTube would look like because people always want to say that, like, you know, what YouTube was a big idea, but what's the next step after mm-hmm. YouTube? It's like, I'm pretty sure that like super high quality video content that you can consume at any time on mm-hmm. your phone is probably like, yes, you will have a TikTok, which is kind of this aberration that allows people to view content in this more, mm-hmm. you know, uh, algorithmic, uh, mm-hmm. you know, fun, cheery world that they've sort of created. It's definitely dope. Like for us, we're having a ton of success on TikTok lately, mm-hmm. um, which I'm surprised that you haven't kind of gotten there yet. Cause I could imagine somebody being able to adapt your content to TikTok super easily. I get so many videos deleted off TikTok. Oh, like really? I just got banned from Twitter. They Everything gets taken down off TikTok. You got it, banned for real on Twitter. I got banned for real on Twitter for my t- cameraman and I were snowed in in Denver. We were staying in a hotel together and I said, hey, Nico. And I tweeted at him, I'm going to beat the shit out of Nico Villacresis. Tweeted at him. He reads it. <laughs> you, you fuck you, dude. They saw that tweet. I'm going to beat the shit out of Nico Villacresis and just banned me permanently. What the fuck? And then on TikTok, it's just anything I do. I mean, my content, it's yeah. uh, there. They need everything to be appropriate for a 10 and up audience, mm. even though they have basically child porn playing out on that platform. And that's OK. <laughs> right. Like my roommate was a screener for TikTok for a while. But I, I think the evolution has been with video content and with podcasting. It's not going to be this new form that develops. It's just the old form of talking heads on news stations who are full of shit, mm-hmm. won't divulge any of their opinions, or if they do have an opinion, it's just the mainstream corporate fucking uh, wh- whatever's like Target or Amazon are saying right now, that's their opinion. Right. That's gone. And I think a big budget Hollywood movies will start to fade out too right. with actors who you can't relate to, with scripts about shit you don't care about in favor of what we're doing, something that's more real and raw. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I saw uh, the biggest success that... Uh, Netflix had during the pandemic aside from uh, the Tiger King was uh, the Queen's Gambit Mm -hmm. and it was something like less than 20 million total views yeah I'm like Mr. Beast puts out a fucking video that gets like 80 million views like once a week. Like the scale, it used to be like, oh, TV shows are just logically much, much larger than Mm -hmm. the most popular YouTube Mm -hmm. content. And nobody seems to have taken note of the fact Mm -hmm. that that's not the case at all Mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Advertisers still don't pay as much for YouTube. And I heard that YouTube is getting double the watch time that Netflix is getting. I believe it. Double. Yeah, man. It's fucking nuts, dude. It is freaky. And I mean, you know the numbers some of these guys are making. It's just... It's it's still tough for me to wrap my head around. Mm. It's um, I, when I'm out filming for YouTube videos, people heckle me all the time. Is this your full time job, loser? Mm. Like fucking get a job, dude. What are you doing? So I can make sixty grand a year when yeah. there are people in this industry making fifteen million, twenty million right. a year easily. Faze Banks was just sitting on this podcast talking about like laughing at the idea of him taking a hundred thousand dollar brand deals. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, like you could send that my way. That'd be totally fine. She, uh, the uh, the misses we're trying to hook up with house phone. She loves Phase Banks too. Oh, really? so I hope uh, house phones are right with a little competition. She got a weird little subculture fucking fetish going on here. <laughs> I don't know exactly where it goes, but yeah, yeah, that's those are two pretty different ends of the spectrum, I guess. A little, your Banks is the one white guy I've heard you say you like. 
I don't know why I'm asking her questions as if she can respond, but yeah, $100,000 for a brand deal he laughs at, huh? Just like a shout out in a video? Yeah, he's like, he's like, I don't even want to do anything like that unless it's like a million plus and I'm like invested in it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, just... Just give me the hundred thousand dollar brand deal so I can get the fuck out of here. I don't want to be in bed with the VPN for life. Yeah, it's in, it's important for people to understand that those sums of money do exist because unless you hear that, you have a hard time believing you can make that much money, mm -hmm. and then you limit yourself. Yeah, a big part of being successful and making money is believing that it's out there for you to get. Mm. And I still struggle with that sometimes. Like I think I'm making six figures. I should be happy with this. Right. But but in reality, making six figures, a hundred thousand dollars a year isn't really retirement money. It's not money that can take care of your family. So I've struggled with that. I've yeah. tried to make myself think in terms of tens of millions instead of hundreds of thousands. Because you, it's easy to forget that you literally had like a hundred bucks at one point in yeah. your life when you were trying to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. And then the business does get to a certain point, but then all of a sudden you're comparing mm -hmm. yourself to fucking Tana Manju for mm -hmm. some reason. Mm -hmm. And you're knowing how much certain people are making and you're comparing yourself to that. Mm -hmm. And it's like your standard just completely changes. But that's why I feel like I've never really had this sort of victory lap feeling of like, Oh, I, I made this much on YouTube or whatever. It's always been a grind to try to get to the next level, sure. even when you have your best month ever. Yeah, that's that's how you got to be, man. Yeah. Like, do you have um, enough to retire right now? Are you pretty much set up financially? No, definitely not. See, the thing that happens, too, is your lifestyle increases. Like, I was talking to Danny Duncan about this. Danny Duncan, his net worth is probably 15, 20 million. Mm. And I was talking to him about that. I was like, you could just retire right now. Like, anything happens tomorrow, you wake up and for some reason YouTube's gone, whatever. You could just sit on your fucking couch and not do shit. He said, yeah, but then I'd be living a really basic life and I don't want that. Right. Which I don't think most people would think $15 million sets you up for a basic life. Right. Most people look at that as a luxurious lifestyle. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you've made more money, I'm sure you've wanted to do cooler things and go to cooler places and buy better stuff and live in a better house. Yeah, and it really for me, as a person who doesn't have any sort of like desires to have anything fancy or nice or whatever, it's really just like a security feeling of mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, if I were to get to this point, and, and you start to look at it as investments too, mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, if I have X amount of money in the bank, maybe I could buy, you know, this investment property mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, honestly, my girl from just OnlyFans is at that point where mm -hmm. she's buying an investment property mm -hmm. right now. And I've had to like see her like slowly get to that point where mm -hmm. she realizes like, oh, this is the kind of shit that I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't just be like, I remember the first month that she made like 20,000, like right when she started OnlyFans, mm -hmm. it was private snap back then. And, you know, she just didn't even know what the fuck to do. Mm -hmm. Like couldn't even comprehend that dollar amount. Mm -hmm. But now she's like thinking of it as like, oh, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to do this in five years or maybe I won't want to do this in mm -hmm. five years. So I got to just try to set myself up for the future right now. You know, what's your number? What do you think you'd be happy with to retire? Jesus Christ. I don't know. Cause like for my, my thing is like, I'm trying to build this business. So mm -hmm. every time I make any money, it's just going back into the business and sure. allowing me to think like, okay, maybe I could, take the business like like I, i'm much happier to like take the money and invest it into parts of this business mm -hmm. that aren't making money yet mm -hmm. to try to like build it out more but so I, I feel like i still haven't really like had any sort of feeling of like oh i have this amount of money it's mm -hmm. like no there's this amount of money floating around within the business mm -hmm. you don't pull some out and save it uh, you know the I, I my salary is like the bare mm -hmm. minimum amount to be able to basically you know what do you think what would you feel good with though personally five million ten million yeah, I mean, I think once you have like 10 million, that's when you could kind of like invest it intelligently and be mm -hmm. able to probably live a good life from there, you know? Yeah, 10 million, what, 8% interest? You're making fucking a couple hundred grand, almost, yeah, like 500 grand, something you know? like that. I think about 500 grand in interest every year. Is what Realistically, you're I probably would need way less than 10 million to relax, but that just seems like a pie in the sky number. If you had that sitting in the bank, you could mm -hmm. probably be pretty comfortable doing whatever. But dude, also, now, like right now, I've. I mean, I'm sure I make much less than you, but I have a hundred grand in my bank account and I was so psyched to hit that fucking figure. But now I'm afraid, like, what if I open up my Fidelity account one day and the money's just gone? Mm. Like, these are just digits on a screen. So that's making me want to go buy real estate. Mm. Like, I'm insecure about the money I do have now. Right. And I feel like that's probably something that rich people struggle with too. It's like, what if the market fucking collapses? What if this house gets caught in an earthquake or a fire, which is common out here in Los mm -hmm. Angeles? Once you really start to have something, it really forces you to consider how easily you could lose it. 
Yeah. You know, especially when you like know people have like had crazy lawsuits or you know like a, a criminal charge. You have to fight an attempted murder, and all of mm-hmm. a sudden you spend two million dollars on that or whatever. That's like once you see that shit. All my whole life leading up to this has just been me realizing more and more yeah. that I do not ever want to be the kind of person that's going to waste their money or or yeah. be not intelligent with that. Any, anytime I see somebody who's like going to the club and spending five thousand in a night or whatever, yeah. for me, I still feel. As shocked by that as I felt when I had like no money seeing people sure. do shit like that, you know? Yeah, and I have a my cameraman actually, his parents, they had a kid when they were older, and the kid had some pretty bad health problems that cut, ran them a million dollars to correct. And when it's your kid, it's non negotiable. Yeah. That's absolutely money you have to fork over by any means necessary. Mm. A million fucking dollars, which most people consider their full retirement money. Mm-hmm. That would, for most people, that's fucking a great retirement system. Some, right. just gone mm-hmm. because they fucked when they were old i've seen people get lawsuits that are like completely frivolous lawsuits and still have to like pay the person off like fifty thousand to make it go away there you go and yeah I'm just once you see some shit like that it's like all this money seems a lot more fluid yeah and know? that wouldn't happen if you're a cpa or exactly. if you're a fucking executive at coca-cola you're not getting sued mm. dude yeah being an entrepreneur is fucking tough man and mm-hmm. you don't realize that when i was in that restaurant in san francisco swabbing tables i thought it was gonna be this fairyland once i quote unquote <laughs> made it right and then you realize there are all these mental health issues you have to deal with staying strong when your fans are pissed at you, right. when people hate something you put out, when you're getting sued. You just like you have to learn all that shit on the job. I've had to start reading and meditating and realizing how to keep this anxiety at bay from being a public figure. Yeah, because when you when you have like a sort of basic job, number one, the restaurant can fail and it's not your fucking problem. You don't care. You're probably but, psyched because you just get some time off. But you don't realize at that time that that's one of the main benefits of being a person that has a job. Like, Everybody in here, mm-hmm. if this business goes fucking to shit, mm-hmm. they get to walk away, mm-hmm. and I'm the one who has to deal with it, which is mm-hmm. ultimately like the the thing that really puts a lot of pressure on you. But okay, bringing this back a little bit, how do you how do you like develop your style on YouTube? Because to me, it feels like I said, feels really fresh. I don't know that I'm necessarily like in tune enough with what your influences mm-hmm. might have been. Like the the part I like about it is that it feels like you're doing stand-up in public with mm-hmm. an audience just mm-hmm. to make it awkward for this like audience that has really not agreed to be part of this, mm-hmm. which I find fucking hilarious. Yeah, man. I, I think it's definitely valid what we're doing because I wanted to do stand-up for a while, but more and more I'm turned off by the idea of just standing in a club, saying jokes, and while doing it, knowing that Louis C.K. and Bill Burr are out there doing it a hundred times better. Mm. That doesn't feel like me making my ultimate impact on this earth. Right. We were talking about that earlier. That's what we want to do. We want to impact people. We want a bunch of people to be sad when we die. That's what I think is crazy about comedians is that they very much go into comedy clubs with like 40 people there and go hard Mm -hmm. the same way that as a YouTuber, you go hard Mm -hmm. expecting potentially, you know, thousands Mm -hmm. or millions of people to see this. Mm -hmm. To me, that the scale of that doesn't really make sense. Like, sure. And I, I respect the art of it and, mm-hmm. and I can very, you know, I've heard enough people talk about podcasts mm-hmm. on podcasts about comedy and stuff. Mm-hmm. I respect it. I just don't really feel like I would be pleased with the impact sure. at a certain point, you know? And all the stand up comedians are now trying to do what we do. At right. the very least, they're starting a podcast, but they the more adventurous ones might be vlogging. They might be out there doing more prank stuff. Right. But um, yeah, man, I just, what I'm doing right now, again, I want it to be impactful. So I'm trying to take my influences from stand up, the golden age of The Simpsons, and put it out there in the real world. Put out a good comedy product, fucking with random people, going <laughs> to places that I think are cool, and just making these 30 minute long, not corporate, not politically correct comedy pieces that you can't get anywhere else. Mm. I just, I, yeah, I want it to be as unique as possible. Did you have to, like, did you always know that you were going to be doing this really offensive, not PC type stuff? Or is that something that you just slowly kind of realize, like, this is basically who I am and what I want to be doing. Dude, I don't know, man. Like, it's out of my... I don't know where it comes from, dude. Like, I'll <laughs> like I'll be taking improv classes, and I have to shape up in improv, especially in L.A., too. Everybody's very Oof. progressive. Like, yeah. the jokes have to be very straightforward and clean. But then I sit down to write, and, like, every joke is a domestic violence joke, <laughs> rape joke, racist joke. Like, I, I it, just, it just flows out of me, just offensive stuff. Right. Like, I was reading her a joke this, that I wrote about hitting women that I was so proud of yesterday morning. <laughs> when I woke up. I was like, baby, baby, listen to this. Right. right. Then I just, I can't help it, dude. It just, for some reason, I'm an offensive person. Right. And I, I, I get that. That's one of my main things is I feel like 
the fact that people think it's not good to joke around about offensive shit, that's gotta be one of the worst things mm -hmm. that has really developed during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 that's a good way to deal with something that mm -hmm. is fucked up or traumatic. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you joke about it because you're not gonna do it. Because you mm -hmm. know that like you wouldn't be able to go out and make those kind of jokes, the racial, racial jokes. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't be able to go do that if you were really racist. Mm -hmm. I can very much appreciate it because it's, it's uh, you know, I, I just like shit that pushes that line. And it's, yeah. as there becomes less and less of that, and even hearing you say something like you get banned off Twitter, I mean, it's a s sad, scary state of affairs these days. Yeah, and you being able to tap dance the barrier of offensive comedy, you're like that, that fucking world, you being able to do that without being actually offensive or actually hurting feelings just demonstrates your social intelligence. Whereas I don't want to be around the guy who just is completely clean, works at Morgan Stanley and can't make any of these offensive jokes. Imagine how much of a psycho that guy is yeah. like, like a dude who will not do anything offensive, say anything offensive, be involved in any sort of undesirable activities. Yeah. Imagine how fucking like, what is he doing? What is he jerking off to? Yeah. What would the FBI do if they seized his hard drive? And that's what's weird is that when I'm, I'm watching a video of you like going to college campuses and fucking with people and I'm just seeing these kids who have clearly absorbed this mm -hmm. like modern woke discord yeah. of, of how you're supposed to act. Mm -hmm. And that to them is just the default. This is how the world is. Mm -hmm. And they have no idea that this is optional mm -hmm. for you to buy into this yeah. bullshit of being offended by everything. It's a religion now. Yeah. The wokeness is a religion. And I think a lot of people just do it out of fear, Adam, because they're worried for their careers. Definitely. They know that when they were at a kegger once in college, they grabbed a girl's ass after a couple Bud Lights and they're terrified somebody had a flip phone video of that. Yeah. And if they fill their Twitter feed with enough angry tweets at Donald Trump and enough cancel this guy, cancel that guy tweets that maybe people will overlook the iPhone video when it surfaces of them grabbing an ass. Right. I think people adopt it as this defensive thing. Like, don't fuck with me. Get that guy. Right. I'm clean here. I'm with you. And the idea that just being quiet or not having an opinion loudly, like I already am, am seeing, you know, the, the comments come in. Why haven't you said anything about Israel? It's like, motherfucker, I don't feel like it's my job to hop sure. in on every political issue that I like admittedly sure. am not particularly knowledgeable sure. about. Like that, the idea that everyone has to hop sure. on that is fucking insane. There's only so much um, bandwidth in our heads. You right. are concerned with music and fashion and you're, you're fucking in on in comedy and you're fucking deep on that shit. Like how much time do people think you have to be reading newspapers yeah. and attending academic lectures on the state of Israel and Palestine? I consider it a great privilege that I very much appreciate that there's a lot of political stuff that I don't have to talk about because mm -hmm. that just seems like everybody like feels like it's their responsibility to have mm -hmm. those conversations and mm -hmm. it feels good to be you know i don't take that for granted mm -hmm. that i get to just sort of not comment on the most yeah. controversial things that i want nothing to do with and for me also like when i do a video on a political topic i always just immediately adopt the side that is not the mainstream one mm. so right now like it's everybody's very anti-israel probably because they, I mean, they probably have some right to be. From what I understand, Israel right. is just fucking destroying Palestinian poor people, essentially. But I just want to go be pro-Palestine right now to piss people off. Mm. Or during the Me Too movement, I did a bunch of Me Too videos that were chock full of rape jokes. Mm. Just because I immediately want to do what everybody else isn't doing. I was crying laughing last night watching you do the, the Me Too thing where you were like, here's a scenario. You wake up with your panties missing yeah. in the front yard of a frat house <laughs> should you report it or just chalk it up to, <laughs> to the game and the girls were getting so mad at you for saying that oh, shit. Yeah. i was i was dying laughing at that shit. yeah like, it's fucking great if you can go there and you can just you know what's going to push these people's buttons right. like isn't that more interesting than showing up with a like a hashtag i'm with her or fucking bernie sanders shirt or right. like a a blm shirt you, you want to watch maybe in a different part of life or a different industry that those are the correct things to do but for me i want people to be entertained and watch you want to see the guy go out there and be hated right and i there's always been something about stand-up that i didn't really like and i think it's uh, in a lot of ways it's someone who is trained to be funny going on stage to a bunch of people who are there to laugh mm -hmm. 
and then trying to be funny to them, and mm-hmm. then they laugh. And this is this, this exchange seems too willing. Like the yeah. idea of seeing you do this incredibly offensive mm-hmm. humor to like a, an audience who has no idea it's coming. Yeah, that's hilarious yeah. to me. That fills a completely different space in my brain. Dude, it's hard too because you're going out and interacting with people who don't want to be around you and they end up hating you. Right. So I have to prep for video shoots like a linebacker preps for the Super Bowl. Right. I, I'm jogging around beforehand. I'm fucking listening to Avenge Sevenfold or we listen to a lot of douchey metal you to get have psyched to, up. For, because you have to get into a different mindset. You have sure. to be somebody other than yourself, even yeah. though you are yourself and you're walking around yeah. in your own body. Yeah. You know, it's definitely tough, man. That's something I've struggled with. And I, I heard Conan O'Brien talking about this on a podcast recently, how 15 minutes before he goes and does his comedy bit, he's this like quiet, introverted, intellectual, thoughtful guy. And then he has to go play the buffoon when he's in public. Mm. And for me, it's that even more so because I don't have the blessing of TBS and Coca-Cola and Mercedes Benz advertising on me. Mm-hmm. So I, it's even less acceptable. So yeah, man, I just, I have to get in that fucking mind state. And I just, I think the best way for me to do it is just to shoot all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm shooting every weekend. I'm podcasting I'm on some form or another every day just to stay in that performance mindset. Right. Like, one of the funniest things I've seen you do was when you were doing the Compton one, which I, I almost thought that I was done watching your videos, and then I saw the Compton one. I'm like, okay, I gotta yeah. watch the Compton one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's a kid who's like blatantly fucked up on Xanax, and you're talking to him, <laughs> and he starts saying something about how he beat his girl. Yeah. And it's funny to think like a lot of people would feel like it was then their. It was beyond them. The onus is on them to basically explain to this guy that hitting a woman is not okay. And you do the total opposite where you start encouraging him <laughs> and just trying to get more information out of him yeah. about beating his girl. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's just telling you shit. And I thought that was like the fucking funniest thing yeah. ever to go into that world and then just embrace whatever the fuck he's talking about yeah. and just let him talk. Sure, because everybody who has a brain knows right. this guy's a piece of garbage. You should not beat your wife. Does yeah. that even need to be said? You exactly. Know? Yeah. And me telling him to not beat his wife isn't going to make him stop beating his wife. Just He's wandering the streets of Compton at six in the morning off Xanax. Like, yeah. whatever you say is not going to change his it's, behavior. This guy, has, he has punched his ticket to prison. Mm. He, it's, it's inevitable. He's going. Right. So why not just get more information out of this guy and see how big of a piece of shit he really is. Mm. And that guy, it actually... That saga turned into more because in that video, he took us to a street where his good buddy El Diablo got quote unquote smoked. This is by a the rival most gang. offensive thing that I saw you do was having him lay on the ground where his friend <laughs> got killed and then you pouring out fucking Aquafina all around him. I was like, if a lot of people that I know who live in Compton saw this, they oh, yeah. might not like the idea of me interviewing this guy. A- absolutely. And he, right after that came out, I guess got numerous death threats from people who were friends with El Diablo in his gang. And he was trying to get that video taken down, but then he would FaceTime me and he'd be smoking meth and he would have all these paranoid fantasies like, they're coming for me. They're coming for me, Danny. I see him in front of my house at night. Holy shit. And nothing ever happened. He's still alive. He's still addicted to meth and still hates his girlfriend. <laughs> but uh, yeah, besides that, nothing happened. But uh, yeah, dude, that's that turned into a big issue. That El Diablo candlelight vigil we had where he laid down in the street. Right. Was there any part of you that thought about taking it down on his behalf? Uh, yeah, I was about to. But then I would figure out that he was high on meth, just having paranoid fantasies. And it um, wasn't actually real. Right. Once I realized he wasn't in jeopardy and he would see things like, like they, they, they put up a new street sign in my neighborhood. That's right. the Crips, dude. They're coming for me. Oh my and God. like that was that was the degree of shit he was telling me. Right. So I, I let that one go. What's crazy, too, is I'm pretty sure that my friend lives like in the exact house that you were in front of when you were pouring out water around mm-hmm. his body. So, Dude, it's fucking real dangerous down there. Yeah. We got warned by numerous people. Hey, right now, especially, I guess a lot of hot shit's happening at the border. A lot yeah. of drugs and weapons are coming in. And then also, I guess, with the, the defunding of the police down there, they have mm. fewer resources to patrol those neighborhoods. So the violence has gone way, way up in right. South central and nobody really talks about that because the la times doesn't want to report that because it's not politically correct right. to say that defunding the police did something bad yeah. but yeah those neighborhoods are suffering tremendously i think gun violence is up like 30 or 40 percent and we were there right in the middle of that yeah and people were like people we had to sleep next to the police station that, yeah. we were so scared did you have security with you or anything or no no 
Right. We had just a big guy who liked to get in street fights come. But so that was about it. from your perspective, when you do something like that and you take a risk that a lot of people would say that you're totally out of your mind for mm-hmm. doing, like even when I go to Compton, I very much like go out of my way. Like I have multiple people that mm-hmm. are familiar with that mm-hmm. area who are going to be able to help me out or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're just like, whatever. If I die, I die. Sure, man. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think, I mean, to some extent, I would die for what I do when mm-hmm. I if I don't if I'm not willing to risk my life doing what I want to do with my life like what's what's the fucking point I've already made a decision to not go to college not be or I went to college but not go work at those white collar jobs and I've made the decision to not care what my peers think of me and the people I went to school with and my family so I guess in doing that death eventually is the price I'm willing to pay in pursuit of the life I ultimately want yeah, I respect that. That's how I kind of feel when it, when people give me a hard time about going to the hood to do a vlog or whatever. I'm like, bro, in the do you know how remote the chance is that somebody's gonna want to shoot me? Yeah, like the idea that somebody could get shot around here. Like, you know how small a bullet is. Yeah, even if someone would try to shoot me, the odds yeah. of it killing me is pretty small. Like, yeah, I'm willing to take some reasonable measures yeah. so if, if I'm gonna be able to make content out of it. Like, you can't just like, and I I feel like I got that from riding bikes all those years. When I think about my 20s, we would be in the worst fucking projects in New York all the time. Mm-hmm. And we always just kind of figured, like, you got to believe that, like, most people are pretty decent people yeah. that are going to, like, see you doing something creative and not just immediately want to yeah. separate you from your possessions. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you know, for the most part, that's always pretty much worked out throughout my life. Even Compton during the day was totally fine. People yeah. were people were super friendly. It was safe during the day. Right. But come nightfall, if you walk down the wrong residential streets, oh, yeah. that's where it gets hairy. Yeah, I've experienced that riding bikes in L.A. too, where like I, I lived downtown for a long time, and one day we're just pedaling through some random area. We turn down a random street. We see some ledge in the distance. We're pedaling towards it, and then I, I, it sort of starts to hit me like, oh, this is a pro- this is like a housing project right mm-hmm. here. And then I see that there's a guy wearing all blue walking towards me, mm-hmm. and he's got the meanest look ever. And I'm riding my bike towards him quite fast, mm-hmm. and then he whistles. And that was the moment where I'm like, oh, my gosh, everybody, let's fucking go turn yeah. around. That was definitely the moment where, uh, you know, there, there's just certain places that yeah. you just really cannot go. Yeah. And, and people's neighborhoods, they just get super protective about, you know. The, probably the worst they would have done was just take your bikes, though, right? I mean, they don't have yeah. any desire to cause you harm for being a BMX kid. Because at the end of the day, like, murdering somebody is a very big deal no matter where you are. Yeah. Like, if you could take their backpack, that would probably be enough. That's why I was figuring with you. And, like, you know, on one hand, yes, people are super territorial about their areas in Compton and stuff. But then at the same time you like a white guy who's like clearly joking around and he's got a camera pointed at him the whole Mm -hmm. time is like, are they really going to see you as a threat Mm -hmm. or like potentially like damaging to whatever they got Mm -hmm. going on out there? Probably not. Well, some people, especially when you're young, you're concerned with respect and other people's Mm -hmm. image of you. And especially when you grow up in those bad neighborhoods where there is no opportunity, I imagine somebody disrespecting you on camera, me coming up and making a joke at your expense could be something that they're willing to die for much like I'm willing to die to put out good content. Mm. So I, I didn't necessarily feel safe at all going up to Compton going up to people in Compton at night and fucking with them Mm. because there are people, I mean, people do it all the time. My dad is a judge and I used to sit in on his cases when I was a kid. People would have a disagreement at a fucking birthday party over a drink getting spilled on somebody's shoes Mm. and they would go out front and somebody would get shot over that. Mm. People would just value ridiculous shit sometimes when Mm. they're young and they don't have good influences in their life. But okay, in your mind, how much separation is there between going to a college campus and fucking with a bunch of feminist chicks versus going to Compton and fucking with people who like in many cases probably like live on the street. Like yeah. how differently do you think about doing those two different things? Hmm. It's actually pretty similar. Even though you know there's no risk in fucking with the feminists, part of human beings doesn't want everybody to hate them, mm. which is why it's always a struggle to get my mind in the right place for right. our videos. So in the video you're talking about, an entire quad an entire like it was um they people were selling clothes it was like a swap meet mm. the entire swap meet was screaming at me the girl goes i'm a lawyer you go if you're a lawyer why are you selling shirts for five dollars <laughs> yeah something like that but it's it's not easy for everybody to be screaming at you and wishing death upon you yeah. and your brain doesn't differentiate between the people who can cause you harm and don't cause you harm mm. it just it, people hating you never feels good right. so it all feels the same to me yeah definitely i mean that is like the whole thing with what you're doing though is like 
I, I see you pushing the limit. Like I saw you, you were just playing the guitar and there's just some homeless guy sitting there and you just are insulting him so bad and giving him the most shit. And at a certain mm -hmm. point, he's just like, what the fuck? And you, you kind of like break character. You're like, man, I'm just doing comedy. I'm fucking oh, yeah. sorry, oh, bro. Yeah, this yeah, has yeah. gone too far. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Absolutely. Then. Uh, yeah, I, um, I, I'm trying to get better at doing comedy that people can laugh with me instead of everybody watching the video laughing at that person. Mm -hmm. I want to get better and, and be because when I started out, I definitely just wanted to be Howard Stern and be insulting and abrasive and just piss people off and get screamed at and get people trying to fight me. Right. I'm trying to maybe for my own sanity, go out and shoot content now where everybody has a good time. Mm. And again, I'm so naturally offensive. that I don't think that's ever going to totally come to fruition. Right. But I am working on that. Yeah. And that homeless guy you're talking about, those were pretty innocent jokes. He just had a shitty sense of humor. Yeah. I remember that guy. That was funny. Yeah, I was just, um, I, yeah, that was. That was just some some light guitar stand up comedy Jeff Ross style roasting. Yeah, that that was funny to me because it's like, oh, Danny plays the guitar as well. Like, why yeah, are you just incorporating all these different skills into it. That was yeah, cool. did you play guitar at all growing up? No, I never even thought about playing an instrument. To be honest, dude, I used to uh, to try to get laid. I would. Cause I'm like the fucking the shitty kid who pulls the guitar out at the party and plays mm -hmm. the Sublime song. Oh I was that God. fucking douche and. Uh, I would tell girls I wrote these songs and then I would just like start fucking playing something by the Red Hot Chili Peppers or like start like start playing some little fucking acoustic ditty and like yeah maybe I wrote this for you and just start playing something by like Simon and Garfunkel right. to try to get laid yeah. and it, when I was in community college and I was super insecure and just trying to find an identity That's just amazing. just trying to fill my empty body with an identity of some sort I was like yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm the smooth acoustic guitar That's guy, definitely baby. a personality type but that's what's interesting when we were talking about like ska versus like metal or whatever is like how long can that be your personality type because my, my boy finn mckenty has this video i on. like finn him he and did. i talk yeah he's I, cool i just interviewed him yeah. and uh, he he basically is talking about um why ska didn't last mm -hmm. and he's like a lot of these dudes who are into ska like in your high school like mm -hmm. try to picture the ska kids in your high school how long did they stay into ska mm -hmm. not like all those dudes i know they went to college and it was immediately it was over mm -hmm. you know and i feel like some people they'll get into a subculture and it's sticky it'll mm -hmm. stick with them for life like it, with the rap shit like mm -hmm. if somebody gets in a rap in, in high school they're just gonna stay into mm -hmm. rap forever likely you know maybe they're not gonna be like a hardcore hip-hop fan mm -hmm. and be interested in every new rapper mm -hmm. but it seems like when people pick that up they tend to like stick sure. with it for a long time even comedy i guess is probably kind of like that you become a comedy fan you gotta stick with it yeah and it, what you're a fan of and what you do with your life you have to choose carefully you have mm. to choose something that's going to fucking age well mm. because you and i you're into music and podcasting you can even if hip-hop dies even if hip-hop is soon in a place like rock is now where mm. it's kind of dead you'll adapt you'll there'll be other forms of music that you like and enjoy and can talk about comedy I'm not going to be making rape jokes at feminists when I'm 50, mm -hmm. but you can just readapt those same skills to the stage or to the podcast, Mike. So we've chose wisely what to do with our lives mm -hmm. and people like the ska dude or a professional scooter rider, they didn't choose wisely a direction. Right. And you have to consider that before you go all in on a pursuit and you don't have much time. huh? Right. It's in your early twenties and your late teens. You got to start thinking, what am I going to do? Is it realistic? Probably not going to be able to make an NFL team because I weigh 180 and mm -hmm. I run a 5540. What else can I do? And right. for me, that was after I analyzed my past, I was good at writing and comedy and I'd stuck to that. Yeah. And it's weird, like certain things like the BMX thing. Like I know everything basically that there is to know about bike riding. I can tell you who invented every trick. I can tell you like w approximately what time period every trick got invented, what brands, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. No one gives a fuck like in this mm -hmm. world. Now, mm -hmm. BMX wasn't that big at that time, even when I was in high school and shit, but now it's like completely like, like all this stuff I have in my brain is just useless yeah. to all the people that I have conversations with. And uh, yeah, that's a big part of growing up and like how, if you want to make it into the world, you have to accept that at a certain point mm -hmm. that like the most important thing to you when you were 15 or 16 might mm -hmm. just have no sure. cultural currency as you get older. What was the peak of BMX popularity was? I'm going to say mm, X Games ish era around like 98, 99. And then there was another big spike around like 2007 when mm -hmm. like there started to be these affordable, uh, complete bikes and mm -hmm. stuff. And then honestly, the market spiked again during COVID. Mm -hmm. And time will tell if that continues to sort of be a thing. But for a while, like people really were 
buying bikes like like you couldn't even buy a fucking tube in a bike shop mm -hmm. because they're just it's crazy demand and also the factory slowed down yeah for me bike i rode bikes a little bit as a kid and I, I had a mongoose and i wanted to get a flying fortress because you use it as transportation to school a lot right. of young kids and that's where everybody who is into bike riding it kind of comes from it's like there's this sweet spot in your life where you sort of want a bike around like 13 14 mm -hmm. before you can get a car mm -hmm. but unlike skateboarding like very few people stick with BMX past high school. Mm -hmm. Whereas with skateboarding, it's much more of a, a real culture around it. You could throw five skateboards in the trunk and mm -hmm. everybody just goes to the skate park. It's like, it's much more manageable. Like BMX is kind of more of this overall yeah. lifestyle choice that's a little harder to manage. Yeah, if you see a guy on a BMX bike over the age of 18, he has a DUI or mm -hmm. he's homeless. Yeah, or like 1% of them are like actually doing tricks and this is like their subculture. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I've seen anybody over 18 doing tricks on a bike in a long time. I've seen people like in the background of your videos, but this is what's called erasure that he's trying to act like we don't exist. I'm sorry. It's I'm sorry. Okay. About, I'm okay. sorry to minimize I, your pain. I understand yeah. the irrelevancy of the subculture that I spent a large portion of my life paying attention to, which is why I'm now making up for it uh -huh. by doing content about the most popular form of music in America. Mm -hmm. It's dude. BMX is actually fucking gnarly, man. It is. Fu I could show you all kinds of crazy shit. Like I'm saying, like I, I there's a, there's a dude I literally who went viral from doing like a 90 stair rail on the beach in mm -hmm. LA. And yeah. His bike exploded basically doing it, and they now cap the rail so nobody can ever do it. But just like I still. See bike tracks all the time that blow my fucking mind. Like there's still people going hard as fuck. Yeah. It's just to a smaller audience mm -hmm. than when I was a kid, you know? Yeah, dude. It's fucking you can get so much more speed on a bike mm. and you can conquer bigger terrain because you have these big fucking wheels. But bailing out, like imagine trying to bunny hop El Toro, realizing you'd fucked up and trying to bail on a bike. It's a lot bigger issue when you have a 30 pound horse pretty much underneath you yeah. versus a little wooden skateboard. Like I filmed uh, the first ever bar spin down El Toro and I filmed the first ever 360 bar spin down El Toro and uh, yeah like when a bike rider falls on a 20 stair it just produces a very different effect than when a skater does like uh -huh. I've seen so many skaters try something down El Toro and just basically roll out of it yeah and obviously it's still very very easy to get hurt but like I've never I've never seen anybody get really truly destroyed on El Toro yeah Whereas with a bike, like if you try to bar spin and your bars don't go the whole way around, like you're gonna get that fucking bar to your yeah. stomach. This big machine is just gonna yeah. pulverize you. Whereas rolling away on a skateboard or like doing a, a tumble is mm -hmm. a lot more realistic. Yeah, you can't. El Toro, by the way, for people who don't know, is a famous 20 stair. Is it in the valley? It's uh, in. It's at El Toro High School down in like uh, I forget. It's like in the OC, but it's uh, it's totally not usable at all anymore. They giant gate up there and stuff. Yeah. 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 It became, it was the go to big spot. Mm. And it's a, a, like a watershed moment whenever somebody does a new trick down it. In skateboarding for a long, long time, I think a kickflip was the only thing anybody had thrown down mm. El Toro. Then 10 years went by, and I can't even think of the next trick somebody did down it. There's who, been so many. But who's the guy that did a tray flip down it and then his fucking wheels broke when he landed? So his board started immediately steering in a weird direction but he did land it like he uh -huh. did it but then his board like malfunctioned he stayed on the board but it like swerved it's weird that was a three flip huh yeah so chris jocelyn was supposed to go down there and do it but chris jocelyn didn't want to do it because once you three flip el toro there's nowhere to go in your career right. you've peaked and i know people have been doing gnarly shit down the rails and in bmx i'm sure it's got its own scene too but mm. hopping down that shit on a bike there are so many more ways you could either lose your testicles or wind up on your head mm. versus a skateboard where your feet are going to get fucked up you might break an ankle but you're not going to die right i actually filmed my friend brandon began attempting to half cab it on a bike and uh he, he came out at fakie yeah that's he rode at it backwards which <laughs> is just hard to even imagine on and, a bicycle and he smashed his head so bad and it went so viral that notably like urkel shared it on his Facebook page. Whoever's running Urkel's Facebook page. Urkel's not the dead one, right? That's I think that's Gary Coleman is the... Yeah, no, uh, what's his real name, though? Uh, Stefan Urkel? No. Urkel, real name? Jaleel White. It's nobody, not... Nobody's holding me. I just... <laughs>
it's uh that that's not good yeah that's not something you want for celebrities like urkel to be resharing your half cab bail down el toro definitely how often do you have to deal with like people being upset about being in your videos i know you blur people out sometimes yeah i mean youtube i think they realized there's this big thing that television has to do where they have to get everybody to sign mm. the, to their consent to be on camera and it really limits what television shows can do as far as hidden camera stuff because mm. they have to bribe people to get signatures probably or they have to send over a producer to talk somebody off the ledge if they're really fucking upset like hey can you please appear in this bit we just did it's for television for us we don't have to deal with that and i think youtube knows they can't police that there's no way that they can enforce people signing their consent to appear in YouTube videos. Right. So it's it's the Wild West on that thing. People can file privacy complaints, but they that. have to see the video. They have to file the complaint. And then worst case, you just have to blur them. Mm. There's no penalty YouTube imposes on you. So right. there's not much incentive for me as a creator to get people's consent to appear on camera. But I noticed you'll seemingly like proactively blur people if you could tell that they're really sure. upset <laughs> sure and if they know the channel and if they find me on instagram like hey you better not fucking use that footage i'll blur their face yeah yeah but if they don't say anything and they're just mad i'm not gonna blur them right that's interesting that makes sense um Okay, when I'm just I some interested in like the progression of the channel in general. Like, was there ever a video or a prank that you did in particular that just really stood out to you as this is a watershed moment in my content? This is so like now I know what I'm doing going forward with this. Also, pause once I have to go to the bathroom. Sure, man. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about. Uh, Asian massage parlors and how like imagine at some point they at some point a new recruit comes in and they have to train her mm. and I wonder if they're like yes you know what we do here right yeah we, we give massages no we jerk guys off mm. it, do you know how to jerk a guy off well and then like some training process has to pr follow that right I feel like in their culture maybe like just jerking a guy off doesn't seem that out of the ordinary it's just, <laughs> that's just how you end a massage like I I I don't know. I don't think they're doing that many non hand job massages. They're definitely not, but it's all it's Russians and Asian women from my experience too. Mm. And uh, those are two very different cultures that both massages end in hand jobs. Right. It seems like that's um th it's not cultural. I think there's some training going on. Every time I ever got a blow job with a condom on was in Asia. In Asia? And I was paying for it and it was always pointless and stupid. Which countries? China and Thailand. Yeah, Thailand is the hooker capital of the world, probably, huh? Yeah. One time I saw, <laughs> when I was in Thailand, like, you always hear it's like the child sex yep. place. Mm -hmm. And I, when the whole, I was 19 when I was there on a BMX trip, but I never saw any sign of anything like that. But then one time I saw, like, there's a sign with an anti symbol and then, like, a baby. You can't but, fuck babies over there? It said something, too, like, no child sex here or something. But I was like, who, what graphic designer was tasked with putting the anti sign around the baby? <laughs> like, we just hate babies in general. <laughs> okay, what, what was the, we were talking about something before. <laughs> I don't know. I got excited because I thought House Phone might be coming in for our uh, big finale here. He could be, but I wouldn't put, I wouldn't invest in it, but perhaps. Um, wait, okay, so important moments that informed what you were doing with your content. Dude, it's, Hard to say. I did a Beatles video last summer that I was pretty proud of uh -huh. where we did a parody of two Beatles songs off Sgt. Pepper and all the lyrics were about our crew and we had a music video and we did it with a musician, Ariel Pink, oh, who's wow. a big LA rocker. Do you know about Ariel Pink? Who is now canceled because he went to the storming of the Capitol. Absolutely. He's been canceled a bunch of times too. He's fascinating. Right. It was just funny seeing all like the pitchfork reviewers that I follow just like, ah, this guy's trash now. Like, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I went to dinner with him once and he was just watching Trump highlights. He loves Trump and he, he likes Trump because he thinks Trump's hilarious, which right. is a completely completely valid reason to love Trump. And he was saying that uh, Sean Lennon also is like super into that shit. Really? John Lennon's son. Wow, interesting. Uh, There's a lot of secret Trump guys. I feel like you're not being that secretive about it. You're definitely a Trump guy, right? Um, I see, again, I said earlier that I just lean into shit that everybody else hates, mm. and I leaned into Trump. I think he's fucking hilarious. I'm not into politics, so I had no opinion on what he was doing, but anybody who is so comfortable with half the world hating him... It was kind of inspirational. And, yeah. and dude, his press conferences, <laughs> it was like stand-up. Right. Like, he was like dealing with hecklers every time he did a press conference, yeah. and it was pretty fucking fun. Yeah, if you look on the bright side, that was pretty... That was an enjoyable part of it. I feel like I learned a lot from, like, watching Trump over 
over the years. Because if you want to model yourself after somebody who really doesn't seem well, I, I can't put him in the box of someone who doesn't care what people think of him because mm-hmm. he did seem like more obsessed with mm-hmm. what people think of him than like almost any president mm-hmm. before him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He did just lean into that heel ro- role, mm-hmm. though, as did Howard Stern, who was one of my influences. And when I first started YouTube, I was into that. I would just talk shit about creators, mm-hmm. burn bridges everywhere, just fuck you, fuck that. And since I've really pulled back on that because I realized I'm not good at dealing with the backlash that comes from speaking your mind people all the time. People genuinely hating you and, yeah. and warring, like forming mobs against you, that yeah. kind of shit. Yeah, totally, man. And you, I mean, you have to be a little bit of a politician. Just like mm-hmm. you can't just speak your mind about everything and constantly talk shit about people in your industry right. because eventually Eventually, maybe you aren't going to miss an opportunity to work with them, but they're going to be friends with somebody who you can't work with now mm. because you tweeted that that person sucks, person A, like five years ago. Right. So I've been more political. Yeah, like I was watching a, a clip where somebody who you were podcasting with, I think it was an episode about uh, Chris D'Elia uh, and his friends like canceling him uh, for whatever when that shit came up about him. And your, your buddy who was on the show with you was just quick to really eviscerate Brennan Schaub's comedy career. Mm-hmm. And I, I just saw it in your eyes that you quite clearly, like pretty much anybody with a functioning brain, agreed with his analysis of his career, but you weren't hopping on it. And I'm thinking like, oh, he, he wants to be on Joe Rogan. He's still like holding out for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty, I just, it's pretty spot I'm gonna on. I'm going to ask you. No, I, I actually like Brandon Schaub. His podcast was the first podcast I really loved. I've right. been listening to it since 2016. Well, what do you think of his comedy? His stand-up comedy? Yeah. Um, I didn't see the special he did that everybody hated. Right. I heard some pretty bad things about it. I've seen some bits of his that weren't great, but dude, I've done plenty of really shitty stand-up too. So I can't Don't talk make it about you. It is. A, dude, I fucking... <laughs> I've gone the up there. This guy's in the industry. Dude, not... I've gone up. Okay. Uh, I went up in front of a crowd in New York. It sounds like you were referencing the video earlier, and I was shit faced drunk. Right. And I, to promote the show, I'd been doing the shit that I just said I don't I did do see anymore. This one where I, I, was, I was talking tons of shit right. about the other guy on the lineup. So I just created this tremendous amount of pressure to go up there and be great at comedy. And I ate shit for 15 straight minutes. Mm. Nobody laughing, people heckling me, people oh, so getting up and leaving. It was bad. It was awful. After you had promoted the fuck out of it and basically made it out like it was going to be this giant thing. It was the worst. It made Brendan Schaub look like George Carlin. But you were super new to doing stand up at that point yeah, too, right? Yeah, yeah I'd done stand up like 3 times. Oh, okay. And I've still done it 5 times since. Right. It just it's um you were talking about you don't get into politics too much. For me, I don't have the time to get into stand-up, to be mm-hmm. good at it. You don't have the time to read the Wall Street Journal every fucking day or watch CNN and Fox News. I don't have time to dedicate to hitting open mic nights constantly. Right. And for me, it's like I would feel comfortable giving my raw opinion of somebody's stand-up mm-hmm. as somebody who just does, like, if the stand-up world hated me, it wouldn't matter. You know, it's like mm-hmm. that's just not my world. Whereas mm-hmm. other interviewers, obviously I'm very careful with how I would go about criticizing what they're doing because I don't want to, you know, I understand how hard it can be. And I also, you know, there's just a certain code of respect. I think even in like the media and shit where it's like, it's nice when the media doesn't feel the need to constantly go after each other. Mm -hmm. And you see that in like the mainstream media where they just gleefully do it all the time. Like Mm -hmm. at least within rap media is like kind of a unspoken code where like the other, the other rap sources don't necessarily go in on each other that much, but then, certain people just sort of like rise to the level of it becoming a a consistent thing like joe budden is famous enough that despite being a media guy at this point he's he's just not off off limits like the the media people go in on him but like there's a degree to which there's sort of this unspoken understanding as a guy who never got into hip-hop what's the greatest hip-hop album in your opinion that i should check out Mm, that's a great question because I mean I could tell you like different albums from different eras that really sort of like represent that era and that place I mean I guess I would throw out that I think like oh man this is tough I mean I'll say Nas Illmatic is like a priceless like if you want to like really hear some of the best rap from like early 90s New York City shit Um, even like I'm kind of struggling on what Jay-Z album I want to say because like the blueprint was like his first big it was his first album but then like i feel like the blueprint was like really the great jay-z album Mm -hmm. like for me i still end up going back to all these tupac albums like all eyes on me and me against the world a lot um 
you know, but, but certain albums that I really, really love during my childhood don't necessarily hit the same. Like I listened to Wu-Tang forever the other day mm-hmm. and it definitely wasn't like, I just don't get much from it in the way that I did when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Like certain albums really hold their value for me. And mm-hmm. also certain albums just don't. And now I just don't really listen to music on like an album basis nearly as much. Mm-hmm. It's much more like song video oriented. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, man. I used to listen to a lot of albums. I would just consume music all the time. And now I just I have to be listening to comedy and stand up for my work. So music oh, really? is just a strictly a background experience for me. Really? Yeah. So you feel like you are better as a comedian by consuming a shitload of comedy? Uh, totally, man. Really? And even I think objectively yes but also i don't feel confident if i haven't put in the work that week i think stand up and podcasting and going out and performing the videos i do is very much something that you need to constantly stay sharp at Mm. to be good and if you had a week where you were out chasing pussy getting drunk lying around watching tv and then you got to perform on friday just Mm. the confidence isn't going to be there you're not going to believe you deserve to make people laugh Mm. so for me i need to give everything i can to getting better and then i I feel like that then it'll be my divine right to succeed but if i don't do that i'm gonna fail that's interesting yeah because i feel like there's a degree of that with podcasting where i want to be super informed about everything that's going on but then at the same time like for me i just don't really feel the need to watch that many rap podcasts because it's so close to like work Mm -hmm. that like when i get home I'm way more likely to watch mm. some shit on Netflix that has absolutely nothing to do with sure. my work. But I guess in part that's because I feel like if I just have some random movie that mm-hmm. I can just start talking about on the podcast, that's valuable. Mm-hmm. Whereas I don't necessarily want to be talking about what the the interview that one of my peers just yeah. did. And I, I appreciate it, but it just it still kind of feels like work to me. But I'm sort of in yeah. that part of my life too where I feel like I've got such a good grip on the content that I'm doing that I don't need to always be studying to get better with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's also I will listen to stand up and I watch The Simpsons or I watch Nathan for You or some comedy mm-hmm. show. I don't watch other YouTube comedians. And I think if you start doing that or you started listening to other hip hop podcasts, right. those aren't good influences to have because I mean those are your quote unquote competitors. Those are other people in your uh, your niche, mm. and if you start ado- like adopting their mannerisms or being influenced by them, that's not good. If you sound like your competitors, right. so I just stay off YouTube. I'm only influenced by outside comedy. Interesting. Um, yeah. Do you do you are you in a different state of mind when you're listening to that kind of like when you're listening to comedy? Is is your brain kind of constantly switching back and forth from just enjoying it and thinking like, oh, that's a great joke, or are you kind of constantly having to switch back to that was a great joke. What's my version of that joke? Yeah. Or what's what's the version of that that I could put together? Yeah, that's an interesting question because when you do something professionally, a lot of times it feels like some of the joy gets sucked out of it. Listening to music. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, like anything, if your job was to fuck supermodels, which is essentially what being a porn star is, like how many porn stars kill themselves or overdose on heroin? A fucking lot. Mm. Like my, if my job was lying around eating cheeseburgers and jerking off, mm. if I got paid 500K a year to do that, eating cheeseburgers and jerking off would feel like work after mm. five weeks. Yeah, and then it, going to the gym and, uh, I don't know, but whatever the opposite of sitting around eating cheeseburgers is would all of a sudden have this weird appeal to you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so for me, comedy, dude, like I... Yeah, I'll still laugh at shit, but absolutely, I'm taking apart everything in my head, and it's not this passive pastime. It is very much work. Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay, what else do we have to talk about? I fucking already put away my list of notes. Um, No problem, dude. I'm going to tell you actually what I literally wrote down. Sure. Oh yeah, well I was I was <laughs> oh yeah when you were, you were talking to a guy with a fake leg and you basically told him to put a condom on it and fuck the woman that he was with with it in Newport Beach. This is one of the moments where I was kind of like, wow, there doesn't seem like there's a line that this guy isn't willing to cross. Dep- and, and then I saw you walk up to another guy with no legs and say like. I have to do you have like a pipe and you're like I have to do so that your legs are fake and the guy just stares at you I'm like oh my god that must have really felt awful yeah for you yeah. no that's I I know the one you're talking about in New York yeah I'm definitely trying to this year cut down on the no leg jokes mm. that's my goal moving forward for 2021 and it's not like you see that many people with fake or missing legs I did when you do though <laughs> you just gotta go for you it. start salivating man it's yeah it's the fucking best and yeah man I uh 
again, I used to do that stuff because I wasn't as good as a performer and a comedian, mm. and I would just go for the shock value. But I don't necessarily stand by all my ridiculing the crippled jokes. Mm, I feel like, are you, you know, are, you know, he used to do that. John Lennon, I guess, used to go around Liverpool making fun of people missing limbs from the war when right. he was a kid. Wow. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about John Lennon. What a guy. Yeah, he was he was fucked up. He had a rough childhood. So you've thrown him and Sean Lennon under the bus throughout this podcast. Yeah, well, John, that's, that's no problem. He's dead. But, but Sean, yeah, I did out Sean Lennon as a Trump voter right. and a Trump supporter. I'm okay with that. Um, so are you like, you, you go out and film every week, but it seems like you feel like you need to have a different backdrop, kind of. Like it, you, you can't just do videos over and over in L.A. Yeah. So you're just kind of like picking a different city out of a hat every weekend for the yeah. most part? Somebody told me, I have this buddy, King Croc BBC, I've already mentioned him. He says he feels liberated to go pick up chicks whenever he's in a different city because he knows he's not going to accidentally hit on somebody who lives in his building or mm. somebody he works with. I feel liberated when my plane touches down in Wichita, Kansas mm. or Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I can metaphorically burn that motherfucker to the ground and there'll be almost no consequences when I come back to LA. Right. I'm not going to see anybody I know. Even though in LA there's really very little risk of seeing people you're going to interact with ever again because there are 4 million people in this fucking city. Right. But still psychologically you feel free when you're in some place where you know nobody and you're never coming back to. Right. For Definitely. the shit we do, it matters. Yeah, I remember when uh, when Nelk was first starting to blow up, we had them come to my store on Melrose at one point, and they dressed up as SoundCloud rappers, and they went out in front of the store. There was like a big line for this meet and greet with somebody, I forget. And uh, they were basically trying to do these pranks with people in the line and everyone recognized yeah, I them. remember that video. And that just became yeah. a huge issue where like the, all of a sudden we had them in bag. We're trying to like get pranks going with the rappers who uh -huh. maybe won't know who these guys are and uh -huh. stuff. But I mean, they were, and that was a couple years ago and they were already way too famous yeah. to really be able to pull that off. I'm sure. assuming you're kind of quickly getting there. Um, Dude, definitely not in the scheme of things. Like, if I go out and we pull some sort of prank, it's happened a couple of times that we've been recognized, but it's never affected anything. I mean, that was just Nelk going right for their target demographic. Exactly, yeah. People, if you're going over a 40-year-old woman, it's a very low chance that they're going to know you, but if you go for a 15-year-old kid, then it's pretty likely, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the good things about today is, like, I guess we're sort of famous, mm -hmm. but it's just this much more, now there are so many more famous people in the sea mm -hmm. that the, like the Leonardo DiCaprio fame, the Will Smith type of fame is fading. And so it's nice. Like we get recognized by fans and occasionally a prank goes haywire, but like the really bad part of fame doesn't exist for us. Yeah. And uh, I hope it never does because being the like the fame part of what we do just fucking sucks like does anything good come from that right like i like that we make an impact and it's cool because if you're famous you make more money which means security for you in retirement but the fame part people leaking your address showing up to your fucking place of work that all sucks right yeah that definitely sucks yeah i mean there is a, but do you think you like kind of discount the extent to which like living in LA just changes your whole attitude on what humanity is like? Because we had uh, the minorities on here the other day and we're talking about girls and stuff. And it just is quickly appearing to me that we think of women of being capable of so much worse shit in mm -hmm. LA. These guys are from Sacramento and mm -hmm. they like hang out with girls that they meet at the bar or some mm -hmm. shit. And the, the, all the shit about like girls wanting, you know, expensive gifts and like girls setting you up to get robbed and shit. They're like jaws drop. Like they've, they've never heard of any of this. Whereas like we know people who've mm -hmm. actually had this happen to them. So we have like a very different view of like what's normal. Yeah, I do. I haven't heard of anything like that. And I, I wish I knew more shit like that. It sounds really juicy. But yeah. for me, living in L.A. and especially knowing a lot of girls who were on Instagram and follow other models on Instagram, the thing I notice is just this crippling insecurity women have versus their peers. Mm. And it's about shit that we as men would just never fucking notice. Really? Like, yeah, like I feel like girls in their 20s who live in LA and who are on Instagram are like, oh my God, her ears are so flat on the side of her head or like her nose has this little scoop at the end of it. It's so cute. And yeah. like just they're finding these faults in themselves that we would never fucking see. And it's leading them to get lip injections or mm -hmm. fucking nose jobs. And then fast forward five years. At first, the one lip injection wasn't a big deal. But then 
They have fucking fake tits and a fake ass, you see, when you recheck their Instagram in a year. Mm. And, uh, like, I think that's what I've noticed with these fucking L.A. chicks that's problematic. Yeah, it's actually insane when you hear girls talking about plastic surgery and you just realize how normal they think doing all this shit to their faces. Mm -hmm. But then if you go to, like, Beverly Hills and you see a 50-year-old lady walking around and her whole face looks like she just got stung by a whole hive full of bees, it's like you. it's so obvious and easy to see what the long-term effect of that is. And some women are able to, like, you know, tread that line where Mm -hmm. they just get small amounts of plastic surgery and keep it pretty moderate. But I see young-ass girls who are going crazy with it all the fucking time. Yeah, and they don't realize that like i mean i'll fucking jerk off to some bimbo bimbo on uges who has like a fucking triple d fucking tit implants and lips the size of inner tubes i'll fucking jerk off to you but you pretty much take yourself out of the dating pool to quality men when you go too far down that fucking road yeah like that just that level of plastic surgery just tells me she has deep rooted emotional issues and like imagine taking a chick who looked like that back to your parents right and i think I don't know. I, th- I think some girls who are insecure and they see those girls on Instagram and they want to look like that, they don't realize that that's not what men want. Right. Like, chicks always want to be rail thin because other girls who are rail thin in interviews, but guys don't want that. Right. Yeah, but I mean, dude, sometimes I'll have girls come in here to do interviews and they'll just be like random guys around from the interview before that. And the way that these guys' brains just stop operating when they see a fake ass mm-hmm. is it's it's crazy. And I mean, I'm I'm totally the same exact way. Even if it's too big, and I'm like looking at it like, oh, that's kind of gross. Uh-huh. I've watched like grown ass men; mm-hmm. their IQ drops to like forty, and mm-hmm. they look like they're about to start slobbering mm-hmm. all over themselves yeah. just by looking at one fake ass. Yeah. Well, we haven't had time to adjust to it. Fake tits; mm. they've entered the culture. We've most people. We've all been with a pair of fake tits. We've been there. We've squeezed them. We know what it's like. I've never had sex with a girl who had a fake ass. Mm. And I assume most of the people whose IQ drops when the fake ass walks into the room, maybe they haven't experienced it either. It's a lot harder to spot it because it's a little less obvious. Like, you, there are girls who have fake asses that nobody knows they have fake asses, whereas with mm-hmm. the fake boob thing, I mean, kind of everyone, mm-hmm. once you get fake tits, they sort of know, you know. Yeah. Dude, fake ass. My girlfriend and I were talking about that. You can't work out hard, I guess. Any kind of contact sport, snowboarding's out. You can't do that if you got a fake ass. Yeah, but it's just a fat transfer 99% of the time when girls get it done these days. Like the ass implant, I've fucked girls with my girl who have ass implants, which mm-hmm. feels way different because you, you go to grab their ass and you can feel like mm-hmm. the plasticky separation between their ass and the, and the implant. Mm-hmm. Whereas with the fat transfer, like where they just take it out of their stomach and put it in their ass, it can definitely be weird. Like it can definitely like sit wrong, and you can see it looking crazy as fuck. But it's much more likely to sort of just coast by without people necessarily noticing. I think. Can you get a lot of size added to your ass with a fat transplant? Oh yeah. How that's much? That's what ninety percent of these girls who get a fake ass these days. That's what they're doing. That's stealthy. I don't think I can pick that up yet. The ones I'm talking mm. about are the implants. The ones where the chick's hips physically widen out because they have to accommodate these two airbags there is a uh, trans girl that i uh, interviewed maybe six months ago and she just recently i'm pretty sure got like hip implants and i'm looking at that like oh my god i would never be able to tell that you were born a man hopefully i'm saying this correctly uh-huh. i would never be able to tell that you were a biological male uh-huh. if i didn't like the hip implants trick your brain to yeah. a whole different level dude. nuts dude crazy yeah that's um the one of the most attractive things that men find in women is their ratio of their hips to Uh their to their waist and their stomach all it's about that's what it's about yeah so if a girl has wide hips and a skinny waist you're gonna be attracted to it even if a persian surgeon in beverly hills did it Mm. and uh for chicks the thing that they're most attracted to is shoulder to hip ratio a guy with wide shoulders and a narrow waist is what her body yeah that's what girls get off on you got that going for you huh thanks baby and (laughs) even if it's uh, even if it's subconscious, like they pick up on that and they fucking love it. Right. Isn't that scary? Uh, I mean, it's it's all right. It's I guess it's incentive to not get fat. I don't get how I've been trying to be skinny for like 20 years. Like my whole adult life, I've been trying to get in shape, mm-hmm. like actually in good shape, mm-hmm. like pretty much where you're at, you mm-hmm. fucking prick. And my, my brain just refuses to follow through with it. I get close. Uh-huh. Right before COVID, I was down to like 215. I'm like 230 right now. What do you do for exercise? Lift weights, cardio. I, don't know. Yeah. I, I have a, a trainer who comes every morning. Dude, I um, 
I lifted weights too. I also just I can't get fat. I'm really fucking skinny. So I, I, I would love to, to put on problem. 15 pounds. But dude, one of the things that might help you is doing a workout that's more fun. Mm. Like that's one of the great things about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, is you the, think probably the craziest workout I ever did in my life was when I was doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah, dude, it's it's the best because you reach you reach new levels of working out because there's incentive to push past your level of comfort when a dude's on top of you trying to strangle you. Yeah. So you're not even thinking that you're burning calories or gassing yourself out. And then after the class, you're like, holy shit, I haven't had that hard of a workout in a long fucking time. And it didn't even feel like I was working out. It just feels like you're playing a game. This is the most devastating workout. Like I just remember days where I would just go back to the house after doing jujitsu for like an hour <laughs> and it would just be like the most... Yeah. destroyed that I ever felt in my life. Yeah, I did. I'm starting to get a little worried that it's because I, I used to train it all the time, never worry about the long term health consequences. Mm. But my instructor, his hands are gnarled permanently, deformed really? from gripping collars and gripping sleeves. And then it fucks with your neck and your spine. Wow. You got to be careful. You got to stretch out. You got to not. There are a lot of positions and techniques that are going to give you arthritis when you're fucking 60 for mm. sure. That makes sense to me. Do you ever like get that feeling though when you're doing jiu-jitsu where it's like this seems like a lot like it's an amazing workout that makes sense but this is a lot of work to put into preparing for this hypothetical fight that is obviously never going to happen where i'm going to be wearing this sort of like suit yeah. on the ground against another guy who's wearing the exact same suit and we're going to be yeah. trying to choke each other out on the ground yeah well the, the thing is when i was in san francisco everybody's walking around with leather jackets or a denim jacket mm. or a north face ski coat picture and just grabbing that oh shit. dude it'd yeah. be the best mm. down here i mean right now you're wearing a hoodie that would simulate a gi this is True. I'm wearing a t-shirt, not so much. But another thing that it's good about it, even if the hypothetical fight never comes, and it did for me, I um like when I was in college and in high school, I would get in fights. I would kind of look for them. I was a piece of shit, honestly. Mm -hmm. But just with my comedy and the shit we film out in public, I have way more confidence when I'm training jujitsu mm -hmm. to have people not like me and to create a scene because I feel confident I can defend myself if somebody gets so offended they want to come hit me. Right. So it helps my comedy actually being good at jujitsu. I would notice that too for sure. Like going to the bar after doing jujitsu during that day where I would just feel so ready for mm -hmm. anything because when you've had a guy on top of you trying to kill you for like an hour – that that's like worse than pretty much anything that's going to happen to you in your real life. Sure. So it just really gets you into that mind state. Like, what are you going to throw at me when I've already had Bubba over here trying to yeah. hurt me for an hour? There, I had this coach, Salo Ribeiro. He's a jujitsu legend. He, the going out to a bar after training, he took this to another level. Adam, he wouldn't shower. He would just <laughs> he would walk into the locker room, take off his gi, grab a comb, and start slicking his hair back. And you're like, hey, uh, Salo Sensei, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I get there ready for the club. And you're not going to shower? No. Women love the smell of man. <laughs> would throw on a button up and then would just drive off to the fucking club and chase pussy right. with fucking armpit hairs on his face. Three guys sweat all over him. That is disgusting. Within like the first couple of weeks of me doing jujitsu, I gave somebody or ringworm. Or got ringworm from them. I'm not really sure, but either way, we were like training this exact exercise together, and the my knee that was smacking into his arm. Yeah, we both got ringworm in that exact, or no, a staph infection yeah. in that exact same spot. Which to me, that's the biggest reason to take a shower after you do mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu is because sure. there's shit growing on your body yeah. from other people. Yeah, it's fucking gnarly. I had really bad MRSA staph infections for a while. Me too. Like antibiotic resistant infections. You had those? Oh, they were anti. They were resistant to that. That's yeah, crazy. it was fucking scary, dude. I had to get my arm lanced once. It was completely swollen up like a, a civil war soldier with a fucking splinter of wood stuck in his arm or they have to amputate wow. they would have had to amputate my arm if it was a hundred years ago and that was from jujitsu yeah i remember around that time period too i was doing a lot of coke and at one point i got a staph infection within my nose which i could probably assume had something to do with mm -hmm. the fact that i was inhaling garbage up into my nostril but then you know i'm going into the fucking mirror like every day and just squeezing so much goop out of my mm -hmm. nose that was disgusting Coke's not really how man. You're not into it? I you look like you'd love it. The problem with Coke, I I like Adderall. That's whatever yeah. it sucks, dude. Because like when I drink now, I go to bed so early that I kind of like I like to take an Adderall so I can stay up later and party. Because I only drink a couple times a year, despite me currently hammering <laughs> down a numb rum. I, I don't think people are gonna believe me. But uh, yeah, the thing with Coke that I saw a lot of my buddies get into is that once you start getting into Coke, it just becomes a companion to alcohol. Exactly. If you're going out to the bar, there's no reason not to do a couple of lines beforehand. Mm -hmm. It just people will do whatever it takes 
makes to feel no pain and not feel any shame about going and trying to get laid. Like when you're on a line of coke, you can walk up to the prettiest girl in the bar and ask for her phone number in front of a table of investment bankers mm. and not worry about the rejection. Yeah. So people, just, they'll chase that feeling no matter what it takes. Yeah, we all know what it's like to drink until the point where you basically have to like go home or go to bed or the night has just ended mm -hmm. and Coke just gives you this superpower to sure. just blast past that mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you can drink a whole shitload more. Mm -hmm. That's what really fucked up partying sure. for me is once I got to the point of drinking, finding Coke, doing the Coke to keep drinking and then also at some point starting to like either drink lean or take pills mm -hmm. during that, mm -hmm. that's when it started to get really bad and I basically just stopped at some point. Yeah, were you having weekends out in Vegas or something where you needed to keep going for two or three days? And that's where Coke mm. becomes really fucking attractive. Not even in Vegas. We were just doing it in Hollywood. But yeah, it was, Damn, it was just wiling out way too crazy. What kind of pills were you taking? Zans mostly. Perks here and there. Never taken that. How bad did it get? What was your rock bottom? It was, I didn't really have like a rock bottom. Like when I, like, it, cause one time I like shared all this with a fucking journalist who was writing an article about me and he just wrote, Mr. Graham Mason has uh, struggled with Xanax addiction, yada, yada. I'm like, I don't really feel like I was ever like addicted mm -hmm. like that. I was just partying. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, it was like, oh, I partied Saturday night and I didn't feel better until like Monday night. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much when I was like, okay, I'm not. I, I can't keep doing this. This is really starting to, or I was going out partying and having interviews booked the next day mm -hmm. and just saying, fuck it and getting like an hour sleep or mm -hmm. not sleeping at all and coming mm -hmm. in to do interviews. And that really started to make me feel like, okay, I'm doing a terrible job at my job mm -hmm. because of the party. And so, yeah. How many days a night were you, how many days a week were you going out? I was kind of on like a Friday through Sunday thing for a while, or even like a Thursday through Saturday night, mm -hmm. Sunday morning type thing, you know? So yeah, you and I are pretty similar because mm -hmm. I, Again, I drank this. This was a, a fucking rare occasion. I drank. But the same thing with me, dude. I started to be hung over until Tuesday right. in the week, and I couldn't tolerate that. And yeah, I would go to Vegas, and it would be for Memorial Day weekend. Mm. And I would be pouring booze into my fucking face hole from Friday afternoon till Sunday. Right. And the only way to sustain that and have, quote unquote, the best time possible in your mind is just to do coke to keep you awake mm. for the day party, the night party. And then you're driving back up to San Francisco where you have work on Tuesday yeah. and all your endorphins are gone and you just feel like killing yourself. Like, yeah. When I see people doing that shit now, it's just like it just doesn't seem attractive to me at all. And every time, like I remember one of the last times I went out partying uh, was I was with my girl and a bunch of other porn stars in Miami for New Year's, mm -hmm. and we went out to Club Live, and one of the girls at a table, and mm -hmm. like there's all these, you know, we're talking to all these people, whatever. I've been with a bunch of hot girls in the VIP, and I was fucked up too, but even, it seemed stupid to me even being fucked up. Mm -hmm. Like, even my fucked up brain mm -hmm. was like, this is dumb. Like, this is a waste of your fucking time sure. and potential. Yeah. And even my fucking Molly coked out brain could see that, and that was... A big moment and i remember like you know all of a sudden it's five in the morning we actually had like the best orgy experience probably of my whole life that night yeah don't do drugs kids you're gonna yeah. have kick-ass orgies yeah it'll be terrible and uh but then those girls wanted to go to the beach at like five six in the morning mm -hmm. to like sleep on the beach and then mm -hmm. keep partying or whatever and i'm just like yeah i, I can't do this like mm -hmm. i gotta i'm going back home i'm going to sleep you know yeah. and that just at a certain point, like when you really start to like weigh the pros and cons of what you're doing, that's when partying doesn't seem like it mm -hmm. makes any sense. Like when you're young enough to not be thinking about the pros and cons, you can kind of do whatever. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I got to the point where I'm actually considering I'm doing this instead of this mm -hmm. and I can't do both, then mm -hmm. you have to start making these hard choices. You know, I think the difference for you and I is that we love what we do. Mm -hmm. So getting fucked up is damaging to what we love to do. Right. And therefore, we realize that at some point and we stop. Mm. But a lot of my buddies who love to drink and do coke, they work in real estate and they don't love it. Right. Or they work for a big company as a recruiter or something. They don't give a shit about the quality of their work. Mm -hmm. So what's being hung over on Monday? Right. It's nothing. For them, their escape is when they clock out on Friday up until when they have to go back to work on Monday morning and they just want to maximize the fun they have right. in that. So when they like, yeah, when I was 26, 27, I realized I needed to start dialing back my partying. They're going to keep partying 
until they're 50 or 60. They're never going to have that reality moment that you just described. Yeah. Hey, like I can see the consequences of this even when I'm high on Molly about to have a fucking orgy. Right. It's still not what I want to be doing with my time. Yeah, totally. And I mean, once you start looking at things like that, it's just, you know, that's where life is really about is like the slow process of learning that it makes more sense for you to act on your own behalf. You mm -hmm. know, like if you are doing something and it makes you unhappy, you could just stop. You could just not do that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that to me is what kind of has led me here. And especially now having a kid, mm -hmm. I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to justify going out and partying and shit when I could reasonably spend that time with my kid and the after effects is going to be that I'm going to be way less present and less happy while I'm spending time with my kid because mm -hmm. I'm going to be hung over the next day or whatever. I couldn't even really imagine it at this point. Although one time I did get drunk on this podcast and then went home and played with my kid while I was really drunk. And that <laughs> was super fun. Okay. I was very in the moment. It, it could be dangerous too, but yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, I don't want to take any risks. I don't want to be like throwing her in the air right now. I don't know if she might hit the ceiling or something. Exactly, man. You're a big dude. You guys going to have kids soon? Uh, I actually didn't wear a condom last night and I, I, Fire. Have been replacing her birth control with Tic Tacs. <laughs> no, I uh, I'm curious, man. What like what is having a kid like? Because that's something that I can't. I mean, I'm 30 now, and like being in a serious relationship. This is like the first long term serious relationship I've been in, so I know what that's like. But the kid thing, I can't even imagine yet. I think me and my girl at a certain point, we had stopped partying. We were living a life where you know I kind of like came home after work and we hung out and watched Netflix together. I noticed that we started to pay way too much attention to the cat. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden we're like really talking about the cat and how fucking funny he is every day. Mm -hmm. And then there was, and, and that just stood out to me. He's like, why are we talking about the cat this much? <laughs> but then we went on Halloween with uh, him right there. He's uh, married to my sister and they have two kids and we went out, we're around like, we went out trick or treating. So we we're seeing all the other kids in the neighborhood and just started to slowly hit us like, this seems like it would very much agree with mm -hmm. the lifestyle that we already have, where at that point I had basically realized like, I want to, you know, work out and, and, uh, you know, go to, go to the office, get my job done. And then like kind of come home and hang out with you mm -hmm. having a kid, like, you know, we've always kind of considered it, but all of a sudden it just seems like the, the super obvious thing to do with our time right now. Mm -hmm. And it just finally kind of clicked. And then now that I have a kid, I kind of can't even imagine that there was a time where I wasn't at least planning for this or considering what this would be like. It, it changes your life so much because you can't, and, and even me saying that is kind of ridiculous because it's changed my girl's life so much more than mine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it really like forces you to take yourself a lot more serious and, and really kind of like focus on simple pleasures because, mm -hmm. you know, so much of what I could assume that your life is about is about kind of charting this trajectory of becoming rich and famous. And, and it's like, it, it kind of forces you into this, this situation where you just want to spend time with your kid just being present and not having anything mm -hmm. else in your mind. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't really have anything that's like forcing them towards that in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. you know? Did it change your relationship with work? Do you take work more seriously now to provide for the kid? Or does it make you maybe take it less seriously in that like if somebody doesn't like an interview or you're getting sued or revenues are down, mm -hmm. you can put that into perspective because you have something more important in your life? It just makes me want to be more efficient with my time, but it makes me want to like get more shit done but you know like when we had the bike shop i used to just be in there like 12 hours a day mm -hmm. didn't really matter some of the day we'd just be hanging out smoking some of the day i'd be doing interviews but either way it was like i was just kind of there and doing the work as it comes now i'm like much more focused on my schedule and mm -hmm. getting this shit done in a certain period of time like there's the realization now if i get home at 7 30 my kid's gonna be asleep and i'm mm -hmm. not gonna see her till the morning mm -hmm. if i get home at six i can hang out with my kid for an mm -hmm. hour and a half and that's very appealing if anything now like i'm sort of like i asked my personal trainer the other day like can can you train me at like seven in the morning now instead mm -hmm. of eight mm -hmm. like i'm trying to bump my day mm -hmm. forward so that i can actually have like more time to get shit done and yeah it just makes me take money a little bit more serious it mm -hmm. makes me just want to yeah, I don't know. There's like a lot of things that used to seem more important, like just being seen, going to festivals and events and mm -hmm. shit like that. That now I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm at the point where I can like pay people on my team to go cover these events for mm -hmm. me. And maybe the audience won't love it quite as much as if it was me. Mm -hmm. But I got to start figuring out how to make this company bigger than myself because I only have so much time and the kid is demanding of some percentage of it. You know? Mm. Yeah, I guess it just it would be tough maybe to 
live your life continuing to do what you do and what I do. Because if we kept doing this without kids until we were re retired, our lives would pretty much look the same the entire time. Mm -hmm. And that might get fucking boring. Yeah. I, I feel like having the little satellite you or the little miniature you like going through high school and trying to go to college and developing their career. I feel like that's some weird form of entertainment mm. or, or change that maybe I'm going to want because life's going to get repetitive when I'm 40 if I still don't have kids. Exactly, because as you get older, there's all these things that, to me, are insanely boring. Like, why the fuck would I ever want to go to Disneyland? I don't give a fuck about going to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to a pumpkin patch. I don't want to mm -hmm. fucking go pick apples or whatever. Mm -hmm. But all those things mm -hmm. with the kids sound incredibly sure. interesting and mm -hmm. entertaining because you get to sort of, like, you be you spend your whole life getting jaded as fuck to everything, mm -hmm. and then you sort of, like, relive life through your kid and are mm -hmm. able to sort of sure. witness things through their eyes. Sure. Everything's new. I seen her eat a fucking banana the other day, mm -hmm. and that was... Like look at look at her face when she ate the banana. Yeah. It's so crazy. Like you know, if you ate a banana right now, I don't I don't think there's anything about it that would be interesting well, to me. The way I eat bananas, <laughs> I put it in your ass first. Yeah. <laughs> that's like just swallow those things down like big cocks. That's hot. Um, yeah. So it's it's almost it's interesting. It sounds like it's the child is sort of for you. It's like it's sort of a selfish thing. It's selfless in that you're sacrificing sleep and right. income and money, but it's also it sounds like it's making your life better, and that's one of the arguments for having a kid. I used to always. I always say that. I used to always think when I would hear people talk about having a kid like it was this selfless thing. I used to always think, how the fuck is it selfless to basically make a miniature version of yeah. yourself and then watch it grow up? That's yeah. like the most self-indulgent thing I can imagine. Yeah. But now that I'm actually having a kid, I, I look at it very differently where it's like everything that you're doing for the kid is pretty selfless like mm -hmm. you're, you're working so hard to just keep them alive mm -hmm. i actually think both of those are, are true at the same time yeah it's just kind of like how you perceive it but mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean it's like the kind of thing it's hard to even explain how much more people like having kids than anything else like me and my girl will literally be with the kid for 12 hours throughout the day on a saturday put her to sleep and then we're still on the couch looking at photos of her and mm -hmm. talking about her. It's just it's it's kind of hard to comprehend how much we like her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in comparison to everything else. Like, yeah. I clearly like her a lot more mm -hmm. than I like like a lot of other things. Like, yeah. I don't want to do interviews every day, but I really like need to see the kid every day. Sure. You know? Yeah. That that's something I've heard from everybody that when you see your kid get born, you feel your life change and you just love this thing that just came out of your girl's pussy. Yeah. Which is which is fucking. She actually came out of a hole directly above. Love my girl's pussy, which is kind of a weird part the, of it. The C-section. Yeah, mm, I'm surprised you still love your daughter as much. Then, <laughs> usually, usually, pussy is part of the equation for the love. You didn't emerge from the actual vaginal <laughs> canal, so to me, you are a technicality. Yeah. <laughs> Just like uh, small dicks don't count, C-section babies. Yeah, so funny too. Those my girl's Armenian, uh -huh. and the baby came out looking just like me. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that I've like planted her Armenian ass with this white baby that she has to like walk. Around. It, it looks like she's walking around with a kid that is somebody else's kid. That's reassuring though, because. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. heard. I mean, there's that stat floating around that 10 percent of babies aren't fathered by the th guy who thinks there's the father. Right. So, I mean, if it was ambiguous, you might have always had that in the back of your mind. Am I really this uh, kid's dad? Yeah. And there's just been so many YouTube or comments or Instagram comments that are basically like telling me that the kid's not going to be mine. So that was a little reassuring to mm -hmm. see that it looks so much like me. I'm like, oh, you guys were wrong. Okay. Yeah, fuck, fuck the haters. You know, it's, it's Adam's kid. Yeah, I heard, um, I, I read this evolutionary psychology book that was really fascinating once. And I guess that's programmed into women to tell the guy that they're mating with, that they live with, that the baby looks like him. Like, oh, he looks just like his dad or she, mm. she looks just like her father. Women are programmed to do that, to make men not fear that somebody else snuck in and fucked their wife when they were out of the nest. Right. Yeah, yeah, I read this book, Sperm Wars, back in the day. I've read it. It's you great. Read it? Yeah, uh, it was amazing. Yeah. But it really helps you understand like that crazy biological desire that apparently women have to basically have a bunch of dudes jizz in front, in, inside them at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. and then just let the sperm fight it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. Like everything we do comes down to sperm competition. Mm. Like your penis is shaped like it is to shovel out other guys' jizz. Right. There are times of the month when your girl is going to be more susceptible to cheating on you. Mm. I um I guess one of the reasons 
cheating happens, I think Sperm Wars is the book that laid this out, is because women subconsciously have a goal of getting pregnant by a guy with the best genes possible, right. but then raising it in the best household possible. Mm. So women, one of the reasons they will cheat is because they will be dating the orthodontist, but then they will be going out and fucking the professional athlete to get the best genes in the best household. Yeah. It's easy to see how that ends up happening, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking dark. Really, if you love your girl, the mm-hmm. the best thing that you could do would be to gangbang her with like 10 of your friends and then see whose sperm wins. I think so. And then also, I mean, if I don't think I can respect myself unless I know I have competitive jizz. Exactly. And if, if somebody else gets her pregnant, I didn't deserve to be the father. Mm. And I'm going to raise that baby as my own. It seems fair. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, baby? Just uh, she said, "Sounds good. That's illegally binding." <laughs> <laughs> Want to do it live on the pod someday? <laughs> Give Adam some content. Sure, baby. Do you yeah. guys do OnlyFans content together? No, we don't. No. What do you think, baby? If she gets an OnlyFans, though, are you going to be one of these anonymous penises out there that's just sort of volunteering themselves? I think people would riot if it was my penis featured in the content. Mm. I think we'd have to hire a stunt cock. There's a lot of like really well-known guys out there who are basically like doing OnlyFans content with their girls and just flying under the radar. And, but there's an Instagram comedian who I show... Well, actually, we talked about it before. Fatboy SSC mm-hmm. is... Uh, a dude who it's known that I think he does some content with his girl on OnlyFans. The other day I opened up a tweet from a random person and it's a video of him fucking his girl on OnlyFans. And I really was not ready Mm -hmm. for what the actual visual of this happening was. So that, I think that's going to be something that happens a lot more in the future where it's going to be like a guy hired for an important role and in a movie, whatever. And it's Mm going to be like, Oh no, when he was 19, Mm -hmm. he was fucking this girl on OnlyFans and we've got the proof. Sure. Yeah. I think if I were to do any sort of OnlyFans content, I don't, I think I don't look good naked and I would be completely uncomfortable fucking like it feels like a vulnerable state for me to be filmed in. Mm. I'm completely comfortable doing almost anything else on camera, as you know, but The only time I would ever do it is if I already had retirement money and this was going to pull in an extra, I don't know, 100K a month or just some Mm. obscene figure. But I, other than that, I have no fucking interest in having uh, somebody shooting up my asshole in HD and then putting that out into the fucking internet. It feels like you, you think that this is going to be crazier than it actually is doing OnlyFans content because nobody wants to see your asshole. If anything, well, one like guy a, in San Francisco does. Yeah. The one sixty year old man. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. The most well, actually, probably one of the most viral things that me and my girl have ever done though is like her and her friend where one of them was eating my ass while one was sucking my dick and then I flipped. Mm. And all of a sudden I'm doing the same thing, but with separate mouths. It's something you learned in the BMX community. Yeah. It's, 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 I sort of came over on my own, but uh, that was a viral day. Yeah. No, I've seen you have sex on camera, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I I just realized that. But uh, that's fucking awesome. But, yeah, dude, for me, I just don't feel like I look good naked. And I, uh, like, yeah, I like my nuts are too big. And then, like, it doesn't look good when you have, like, a not that giant of a cock at all. You have a hangy sack? Um, dude, one of my nuts like is from Jackass, that the old man prank where he's no. got the ball sack hanging out. It, his it, it's it's not that bad, but one of my nuts is definitely way bigger than the other one. Like the Whoa. day I hit puberty, like this hormone surge happened, and it's like one of my nuts like doubled. Wow. Yeah. I smashed my nuts so bad riding BMX one time that a I had blood in my jizz for a few days, uh-huh. and then b still to this day, all these years later, that was probably almost ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Like I will kind of warn girls before we shoot only fan content like just go gentle on my ball sack yeah because it's a little sensitive yeah that's fucking rough dude for me like my uh, my nuts are such a big target because they're fucking big like i have to wear an xxxl cup when i go and train brazilian jiu-jitsu xxxl wow. yeah and you know the dude who packed that order at amazon is like oh mr big dick all right fucking rolls the tape on but it's actually just this dude in la with a big nut right who has to buy that cup do you wear a cup just in your day-to-day life? No, that'd be pretty extreme. Maybe <laughs> pretty I should cool, start, right? though. <laughs> what if so many net taps you or whatever? You know, all kinds of things. Dude, I, uh, I, when her, my girlfriend and I went home to visit my fucking mom, I was walking a dog with one of those slinky leashes where the dog, it's like it's on a coil so the dog can run off and then you can pull him back tight and like it adjusts the length of the leash. My mom unclips the fucking dog when he's across the room after we get back from the walk and this metal piece just comes flying from the spring-loaded 
leash and hits me right in the testicles and I was down for about an hour. Wow. And that's the, one of the hazards of just having a big right nut is you're always vulnerable to shit like that. That's very, very true. Uh -huh. One last like content question. When you go to a random town, uh, city, et cetera, to do a video, how much of what you're going to do and the material is planned out and mm. how much of it is just on the fly? Sometimes I feel like it seems like you've really got a plan. Sure. Some, sometimes you like blatantly have like props ready for mm. jokes that you've clearly prepared. Sure, how sure. much goes into the preparation for each video? I'd say a lot. Yeah. yeah I definitely try to write for two hours every morning. Oh. And sometimes it's stealthier. Sometimes I'm setting up the, a lot of the stuff that feels organic and unscripted is actually planned out carefully. Uh. So it's hard to tell. But yeah, man, when you go out with absolute Absolutely no plan, which I've done many times. You're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to be really fucking funny that day. Mm. Whereas if you have some material to lean on, it's less stressful to go out shooting. Right. And then plus it's just fun to write stuff. Like I love cracking myself up when I'm at my keyboard in the morning. Right. That's dope. Mm -hmm. I really respect it because I've I've got so much experience of like going to different cities and doing different things in those cities. Like you know, obviously the BMX shit for forever. Some I'm used to like going to different cities for rap shows and basically like sitting around in the hotel for fucking hours and hours and then just going to the show and doing it and then that's it. Um, but the idea of like going to a fucking different city with the idea in your head of just fucking with people and just somehow making something funny happen. Yeah. That's, that, it, it just must be a wild feeling going into it, knowing that you have to deliver on that shit. Sure. Yeah. And that's why I would resort to making fun of crippled people. I was just gra <laughs> desperately grabbing stuff. And like, since I've learned more and more about comedy and I know the rules of improvisation, mm. I know how to find comedy in just everyday situations. It's become I'm a little bit better at it. But yeah, man, it's it's uh, it's still something I'd rather come with some preparation and some props. Have you ever gone somewhere to do a video and just had a completely bomb and you didn't have anything that you could make something Ooh, out of? yeah in the early days i would drink a lot on camera uh, because if you're fucking drunk it's just it's so easy to produce content right it's just you have no inhibitions you're completely comfortable on camera around people making a fool of yourself so i had to stop drinking in videos not all the way i'll still drink in maybe two or three videos a year uh -huh. but i had to stop using that as a crutch mm. because what you were talking about earlier i would have the monday tuesday hangover and then your work week suffers that week and you're less prepared for the next video right so at some point i had to cut it off yeah like even when you got drunk for that comedy show in new york for mm -hmm. that one video yeah like when you look back at that does that seem like kind of a mistake because i'm watching that thinking mm -hmm. like you seem like you're so good at your job that when i saw you getting drunk as fuck for that i'm like oh so he, he is nervous or he sure. is he sure. isn't like necessarily fully suited for this yet sure yeah absolutely mm -hmm. that was a mistake yeah, dude, you just it's easy to create content when you're fucking drunk. Like if we you and I just got blacked out, I'm sure we would get into some deep confessions. I mean, we've already been pretty forthcoming here, but uh it's just it's simple and it wouldn't even feel like work. It would flow by right. if, if you and I were taking shots back and forth. If you're fall down drunk out in the parking lot, mm -hmm. That in itself is yeah. like, that's a video. Like sure. Danny is fucking blackout drunk. Sure. And look how funny it is. Sure. Yeah. Like you and I would start fucking wrestling. We would knock over a camera. It would mm -hmm. be good vlog content. But eventually, like, you have to realize that that's not a sustainable plan. Mm. And so that's changed. You should do a video. This would be my request. I want to see a video where you basically become Gigi Allen. You want me to throw my own shit at the audience? Uh, just something like that. Like, just go out to, like, a beach town or some <laughs> shit and just be, like, dude, just, be, just become him. Like, dude, I want to see the bald cap, all dude, the tattoos, fake it. blood. I, my so my cock's the right size. Uh, dude, I love that idea. Uh -huh. I, I love a Gigi Allen video. Oh, I grew up worshiping that shit. Gigi Allen, I assume most people know who he is, but I actually studied him in a class in college on performance art. There was a part of the class on performance art. And he, for people who don't know, would go up on stage, put bananas up his ass, then pull out the fucking the the rinds and the fucking pulp and throw it at his fans he would go out and just fight people in the crowd that had paid to come see him his drummer played naked gg sung naked and then he promised for years he was going to kill himself on stage eventually at one of his shows right but he overdosed on heroin before he could do it and i actually watched a documentary about that night recently mm -hmm. and it showed him sort of like marching through the streets of new york city mm -hmm. like totally fucked up like pretty much naked mm -hmm. and it was insane actually one day 
day we were sitting on Melrose and his brother Merle, who always had the crazy ass Hitler mustache yeah. that hung down all the way past his top lip. Mm-hmm. I saw him walking down the street and actually hollered at him and he actually ended up hitting me up, I think on Facebook, and said that he was down to do an interview at some point, but mm-hmm. we did not continue that conversation. But I, and, That sounds and good. Probably like half of 1% of my audience would actually watch that, but I would love to talk. I got to figure out how to hit him up again. Yeah. Dude, I think a Gigi Allen video would be awesome yeah. to have some fucking show and pay people to come in and get a crowd of unsuspecting people and just do some fucking gg shit oh my that's God. a great idea dude. that'd I be love so it. good throwing fake poop at the audience and shit it'd be awesome dude and then like do uh because i've done a couple musical videos where we like do music videos and change the lyrics sort of weird al yankovic right. style totally do a gg allen parody song That'd be fucking sick, man. That would be sick. He had some songs that were like really crossed the line, though, at a certain point. He had a song called It's Okay to Show Your Dick to Kids, I think. What's wrong with that? Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Danny Mullen. Yeah. No Jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, subscribe. Nojumper.com if you want to support. We'll be on stream on Friday. Any uh, last words for the people out there? No, man. I just, I really enjoy this. I appreciate you having me on, man. It was fucking rad. Appreciate you too, man. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the Gigi Allen video. Don't act like you didn't see it coming.